complex to this ruthenium complexes uh, compound, ruthenium compound, and studied their binding capacity to DNA of cancer cells. So uh, we have done several absorption and emission spectra to understand their binding affinities, and we have some. Uh, uh, reported that they do bind very well to the DNA of the cancer cells. Here, this graph I am what I am representing is is the viscosity graph, which shows the binding of uh, different concentrations of these compounds to uh, uh, thymus calf thymus DNA. So, and their binding affinity. This black color one is a ethidium bromide, which is a known uh, best intercalator with the complexes. So, this is showing the higher affinity. This is used as a standard. And these three are the complexes. So, the, with these three ligands. So, we have studied their competition studies. Ma'am, uh, screen, please. please screen. So what we have studied, the, what we found that the complex one phenanthrilone is uh, showing the higher affinity to bind to DNA. Uh, Sumati, ma'am, please uh, share the screen. It's not visible. Can you please share the screen? Hello. So further, what we studied is further we try to understand whether these upon binding to the DNA are these causing uh, cell death. So we have used MCF7 cells and checked the cell death in them using annexin 5 staining, propidium iodide staining. And we found that complex 1 is showing higher number of cells which are dying. So and then we, we quantified this with uh, MPT assay that shows uh, the uh, higher cell death rate for this complex one. Further, in order to understand the binding affinity and binding inter interactions, competitional studies were carried out wherein the, these complexes were docked with uh, DNA and claudine 3 protein. So we have done the docking studies. Uh, if possible, can you please share screen, ma'am? Or shall I screen sh share? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Fine. Thank you, sir. Yeah. See, th these these images, these yellow color ones, or these these are the compounds which are binding to the DNA are shown here, and this tabular column shows the uh, band le uh, bond length of these compounds, which is pretty much less than three angstroms. And uh, these are the pro This is the claudine three protein. Claudine by claudine three protein is this protein is overexpressed in breast cancer cell lines such as uh, MCF seven and MDM two. So we have chosen this protein whether it is uh, these compounds are having affinity to bind to how, how they are causing this cell death, whether they are binding to DNA or with, with the same affinity, they, are they binding to the uh, proteins which are overexpressed in these cell lines. So what we found is they, they, are, they are binding to protein, but with lesser affinity. You can see here bond length is about three. So which shows that the, the uh, uh, higher the bond length, the weaker the interaction. So they bind very well with the DNA and cause the DNA damage and they whereby cell death. Thank you. So I request any suggestions or uh, doubts. Uh Dr. Jagdish, do you have any questions to the participant? If not, uh, ma'am, I have one question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, could you please summarize in one line the essence of the poster? What What is the key takeaway from the poster? Key takeaway is we have these three compounds which are showing uh, anti-cancer properties, whether they are binding to uh, uh, they are no binding to DNA more or uh, come, uh, binding to proteins present in those cell lines, uh, uh, cancer cells. So what we found is they are binding more to uh, DNA or the cancer cells compared to protein and causing cell death. Great. Very nice work, uh, Dr. Pushpanjati. Very done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Well, if there are no questions, maybe let's move on to the next talk. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And Dr. Sumati, you can take over now, ma'am. All right. Um, our next participant is um, Ms. Joveria Uzma. If you are available, I will share the screen and yes. Ms. Juveria Uzma. Um, I don't think she's available, ma'am. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next participant. The next participant is Prasanna Kumari. She's a PhD scholar from the Department of Biotechnology, University of Telangana. Ms. Prasanna, if you're here. Ms. Prasanna, you have um, five minutes. I'm going to give you the rights to unmute yourself. Ms. Prasanna, can you hear us now? Yes, ma'am, I can. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, dignitaries and all the participants of the event. I am Prasanna Dhondi, research scholar under supervision of uh, Dr. Kasula Kiranmai, Department of Biotechnology, Telangana University, Nizambar. Uh, I'm here to present my uh, research work going on in my uh, PhD. Uh, and I'm presenting as a poster, revealing genetic fidelity of micropropagated turmeric plants using RAPD markers. So turmeric is a medicinally important plant which is belonging to the Vivaraceae family. And it is botanically related to ginger. Uh, it has many antioxidant properties. And uh, it is also having curcuminoids in them, which is uh, also a very good antioxidant, having many anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory uh, properties for it. And coming to its uh, uh, diseases, like uh, turmeric is uh, having a much ill loss due to rhizome rot, which is caused by fungus Pythium graminoculum. Uh, as this turmeric is a monocotyledon species, it is rarely flowering triploid plant. It is vegetatively propagated by rhizomes of turmeric. So to overcome high rate of fungal contamination in this, uh, the micropropagation can be carried out and uh, there is uh, a chance of good regeneration from turmeric rhizomes as explants. Uh, so we have uh, worked out on this and we have uh, uh, standardized a uh, sterilization protocol for disinfection of these rhizomes by using different sterilants like uh, tween IT, Bavistin, HGCL2, and Hypo. Uh, then after uh, sterilization, we have air dried these explants under flow and we have, in, uh, we have inoculated them on regeneration medium with different concentrations of uh, hormones combined with it, where we have used uh, kinetin and uh, NAA in combination, where different concentrations of kinetins from one uh, to, uh, so from point one to one, we have used in combination of different concentrations of NAA, we have resulted one step regeneration protocol in this combination where we have used 0.7 kinetin with 0.2 NAA per liter. And uh, next coming to, uh, so we have a parallel basal medium. Uh, when we have uh, inoculated on basal medium and we have uh, subcultured on the medium containing BAP and TDZ with NA combination, we have generated multiple shoots, almost from 20 to 30 shoots per explant. And we have shifted onto the rooting medium and then we have uh, um, got uh, regenerated plants and these regenerated plants are uh, uh, for all this data we have gone for statistical analysis and uh, uh, we have recorded the data and uh, uh, these conventionally propagated plants are uh, uh, made uh, they may have the somoclonal variations when comparing to micro micro propagated plants so this uh, may result into somoclonal variations to check this we have uh, uh, gone for different uh, uh, RAPD analysis in this, uh, there are many different strategies from which we have gone for RAPD analysis. And this is a single arbitrary sequence of 10 base pair oligonucleotide 
we have performed with 10 different uh, uh, RAPD markers from which we have got results like uh, from AM9 uh, RAPD marker with 10 nucleotide sequence. And for this, we have gone for uh, DNA isolation using CTAB method. And after isolation of uh, DNA, we have gone for amplification by using thermocycler, 25 microliter sample we have taken. And uh, this uh, thermocycle, this amplification uh, with three different steps of denaturation, annealing and extension. Denaturation was for 94 degrees centigrade for one minute and annealing was at 36 degrees centigrade for one minute and uh, elongation was for 72 degrees centigrade for two minutes. Later on, uh, after uh, uh, getting the product of these, we have gone for gel run uh, electrophoresis and the bands which we have gone uh, got uh, are this uh, that is displayed on this uh, Ma'am, can you uh, see my marker, ma'am? Yes. Uh, yes. So these are the bands. This is a control. This is uh, a ladder which we have uh, uh, loaded. This ladder is of uh, 100 base pair ladder. And this is a control. And uh, the remaining all are of uh, in vitro plants. One, two, three, four, five, six are of in vitro plants of Dugirala. And we have checked the genetic homogeneity of these all more micropropagated plants with this control plant. And we observe four different bands which are similar in all the micro micropropagated uh, plants of Dugirala. And along with that, we have worked on BSR. Here also we have uh, observed the homogeneity of uh, this uh, micropropagated plants with control plant in uh, different uh, my micropropagated plants which are selected randomly. This is also a large- So you have, um, sorry. Madam. You only have one minute, ma'am. Yeah. So this yeah, is a you. ladder. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, again a ladder uh, by which we have gone with the control in the second lane. And the remaining all, all the six are again uh, micropropagated lanes of uh, this BSR. And here we have uh, observed that all these uh, micropropagated plants were having genetic homogeneity with the control plant. So by this, uh, we can say that these plants can be micropropagated and can be used conventionally or commercially in the market. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Prasanna. So I'm sorry, I'm not from the field of plant biotechnology. I'm from animal sciences. So could you please uh, enlighten me about uh, the novelty of this work? Is it like a routine procedure that you carry out for the micropropagated plants? Uh, RAPD analysis, what is the significance of it? I mean, I'm asking as a layman, uh, you can go to the basics. Actually, there is a high yield loss, madam, uh, due to this uh, fungal. Uh, my main aim yes, is to go I understand. I understand that. I understand what is RAPD analysis. I just want to know the relevance of RAPD analysis in uh, micropropagation, plant micropropagation, whether it could be turmeric or gender yeah. or whatever it is. As this plant is vegetatively propagated, madam, we cannot produce any hybrids. So because of that, we have to perform this uh, uh, micropropagation to get this homogeneity. And we can go for genetic transformation studies if we go uh, for this, madam. If once it is homogeneity, genetically it is homogeneity with control plants. So we can go for gen uh, genetic transformation in this field, madam. And we can develop uh, disease-free plants or we can uh, resist disease-resistant plants as uh, we are having uh, much of yield loss because of these infections. So we can go for genetic transformations. So I'm sorry. So you're saying that uh, having homogeneity is crucial for going ahead with genetic transformations. Yes, so you're testing homogeneity by using RAPD markers. Is that Yes, ma'am. Yes, oh. ma yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Any other questions yeah. from... Other participants or jury members? I mean, I appreciate the work, uh, Prasanna. It's, it's uh, very well explained, beautifully presented. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks, Prasanna. Uh, can Thank we you. move on to the next participant? Yeah. I think Juveria has missed her turn. Uh, maybe we can give a chance to her. Javeria, if you're here and if you're able to unmute yourself. Ma'am, uh, Unmute myself, madam. I'm Ma speaking from other ID. Okay. Javeria, yes, you're... Yeah. Okay. 
Can I use another system? Yes, yes, no. Um, Javeria, you can join from another device. Just make sure that yes. two devices are not together. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to present my data on bioinformatic analysis of catalyst gene in Jarbara Jansali. Jarbara Jansali is an ornamental plant, widely known for its attractive cut flowers. This uh, Jarbara, uh, it is globally grown all over the world and it is very prone to abiotic and biotic stresses. So it is generally grown in poly houses. Despite poly house grown, it is uh, very sensitive to various types of stress. So uh, this stress, which uh, upon acted uh, on a plant, will develop many uh, reactive oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species are toxic in an over concentration to a plant. So uh, in our study, we are uh, doing analysis of catalyst gene. This catalyst is an uh, enzyme which uh, hydrolyzes, catalyzes the reaction of hydrogen peroxide and uh, uh, it uh, cleaves it into water and oxygen. So the hydrogen peroxidase is one of the reactive oxygen species which is very toxic to a plant. So here uh, we have in our study, we retrieved the transcriptomic data uh, of Jarbara deposited in NCBI under the sequence retrieve archival of PRJV 12127 by uh, Fu et al. in the year 2016. From that transcriptomic data, we have uh, pulled out some contexts which are uh, cDNA sequences of married lengths. From this, we have filtered some full length cDNA sequences. These cDNA sequences were subjected to translation tool known as Expressing. It is a bioinformatic online software tool freely available. So in this, uh, the contexts which are made up of cDNA sequences were translated into amino acid sequences of six uh, reading frames. In these six reading frames, we have chosen one ORF, that is open reading frame, of uh, nearly 5 out 5 amino 15, 18 base pairs. This was again uh, translated into a putative amino acid of 5 out 5 amino acid length, as the other catalysis, as reported from previous literature studies, was uh, in between 495 to 5 out 5 amino acid long. So uh, we have uh, pulled this ORF from Expressi Translate website and Expressi website and this uh, translation uh, amino acid sequence was subjected to blast, blast free where we, uh, we have retrieved many uh, protein sequences which are uh, related to this catalyst sequence of Jarbara where uh, these uh, related sequences had an E value of zero or less than zero, which indicates that the expectation value, uh, uh, the less the expectation value, the more will be the relatedness. So we took the 10 to 12 sequences from BLAST and uh, we took the faster sequence and we have subjected it for multiple sequence alignment uh, using cluster omega bioinformatic tool. In this cluster omega bioinformatic tool, we have got a multiple sequence alignment of our sequence that is our query sequence with all other database sequences, where we came to know about some of the highly conserved sequences, which are uh, specifically connected with catalyst enzyme and its function. And we have found uh, some conserved heme ligand sequence like RIHSYDTQ and some active site signatures, which are related, which are uh, necessary for the functioning of catalyst enzyme. And we have also noticed several conserved amino acids like histidine, aspartame, and tyrosine which are also present in other plant catalysts. By this, we have uh, got a clue that our uh, sequence is a related to catalyst enzyme sequence. Then later on, after this, we did phylogenetic analysis of our amino acid sequence using Mega7 software, which revealed that our catalysts are uh, closely related to Helianthus annus and Cyanara cardinalis, which also belong to the same family composite uh, to which our Jabara belongs. Then uh, using code param website and using uh, Swiss model uh, online tool, we have uh, came to know about the homology model of our catalyst enzyme. This uh, uh, Swiss model is an online bioinformatic tool which helps to create a uh, hypothetical structure, secondary structure of our uh, en enzyme or protein. So 
so this uh, the given structure is uh, designed using this model online software uh, online tool which uh, shows that there are uh, very many features which are conserved and are related to catalyst fold so by this we can uh, say that our uh, sequence which we have retrieved from ncbi belongs to catalysis and uh, it will uh, any modification in this enzyme will help in uh, further uh, functioning of uh, catalyst gene and along with this we also found out the molecular weight and isoelectric pi uh, using expressive tool and uh, along with this we also found many uh, uh, parameter protein parameters like uh, hydrophobic amino acid residues and hydrophilic amino acid residues these residues will help us to know the function of our uh, enzyme that is whether it will be Uh, uh, membrane bound because most of the membrane bound proteins they are hydrophobic in nature so we can know the function of our uh, query sequence whether it is hydrophobic or hydrophilic that we have done using prot param online tool which gives us many protein so parameters Vera, i have to stop you now because you exceeded the time limit okay if anybody has any questions for uh, mr varia they can go ahead yeah hello juveria uh, that was a nice presentation uh, so i have few questions for you so let me clarify a few things before i ask you that so general genome is not published yet could you please mute the other device i'm having echo yeah that's great so uh, jerbera genome is not sequenced right it's not available yes. so you have used degenerate primers to pull out this sequence no uh, ma'am by using illumina sequencing the transcript mm -hmm. of jabara was oh you already have the transcript okay okay yes, that's that fine that was uh, we took from sra uh, from ncbi it was uh, deposited in 2016 by yeah. etn who it all Yeah, yeah. Okay, that uh, that's fine. So you have the ORF with you. You have the ORF clone with you. Yes. Okay. No, we we didn't go for cloning yet, ma'am. Okay. This is only. So all this is right all this is in silico. Yes, ma'am. In silico. In silico. Okay, fine. The uh, further studies we have to do for RT PCR uh, for doing cloning and all that. Okay, so what is your uh, main objective? Like, what are the next steps? Uh, now you have understood that the sequence that you have is actually catalase. So, what is yes. the next step for the uh, study? We will we come to know we will come to know about the relationship of our catalase with other uh, catalases which are present in other plant genomes. Yes, uh, that is uh, known from the phylogenetic analysis. But what do you yes. propose uh, the next step of this course? Uh, we can. Uh, Uh, modify this catalyst gene sequence by various gene editing technologies to make it a uh, stress resistant in uh, um, various therapeutic and therapeutic stress studies we can use the data obtained okay okay thank you i have more questions but i think we are already running late uh, behind schedule so thank you javeria anyways thank thanks for the presentation yeah Vikram, right. Uh, because we are running out of time, we would like to shorten the amount of time that we give for the presentations. So we'll cut it down from five to three. So please note that the time is only for three minutes. Um, all right. Our next presenter is Shani Garapu Prasanjali. Prasanjali, if you could raise your hand, then I will be able to unmute you. Yes. All right. Perfect. I found you. Yeah. She has done her MSc Biotechnology from TSW RDC, Mahindra. She is from Mahindra Hills, and her topic is chromosomal aberration and dynamics in breast cancer patients treated with radioactive therapy. Implications for radiation and bio diverse bio dosimetry. So please go ahead, ma'am. Yeah. 
you can go ahead now and speak okay ma'am thank you for the opportunity to me i am prashanjali from biotechnology telangana social welfare degree and pg college mahendra hill presentation of the my talk topic is chromosomal aberration dynamics in the breast cancer patient treated with the radiotherapy implication for the radiation bio symmetry in this study the radiation induces chromosome aberration such as a dysentric chromosome and translocation by by using these estimation chromosomal aberration been applied as healthy yeah hello uh, prashanjali is it prashanjali is it prashanjali uh, may i please interrupt you Uh, yes uh, instead of reading it out could you please explain the summary of your poster in few words or few sentences ah okay ma'am what is that did they do actually what did the scientists do okay ma'am hmm. by using these um by using these established a well defined study of population and investigation longitudinal partial body radiation and exposure and result in the chromosomal aberration here we found that radiotherapy induced dysentric chromosome translocation frequency were stable here that the cytogenetic biodiversity is a promising tool to assess a genome instability after radiation exposure and has a numerous application for the both clinical radiotherapy and medical response to radionuclear action um yeah we can hear you please go ahead finish okay yeah um, yeah so what so you are presenting someone else's work right uh, what do you like so much about this uh, research mom what what is that that caught your interest that you decided to present a poster on this topic what did you like about their work uh, am i clear am i audible yes ma'am yes what did you like so much about their work that you wanted to present this to the audience here today because of the chromosome aberration dynamics in the breast cancer Okay, okay thank you prashanjali thank you thank you it's a good thank effort you. keep up keep it up keep up the spirit and keep working on it okay thank you for yeah. giving such a wonderful opportunity to me ma'am thank, thank you. you thank you thank you so much prashanjali our next participant is uh, kare hindu uh, she is done if you are around yeah is she there if you can raise your hand then i'd be able to unmute you okay hindu from जी Molecular increase into receptor binding of recent emerging SARS COV2 variant. And first of all, we examined several various variants of content, including alpha, beta, gamma, and demonstrated that. the five variant receptor binding site increase the binding affinity and based on this experiment the scientists done some other experiment and in this the first one is flow cytometry flow cytometry by using flow cytometry of the binding affinity between sars cov2 variant and receptor binding domain in this experiment 
we should then this result by using a cyclometry and in this experiment we have to find the binding affinity in this the strongest binding affinity is for mink y 453f rbd and the weakest affinity is for mars cov2 rbd in the statistical significance was arrived by using one way anova in this binding affinity and now i am moving to the second experiment and the second one is binding affinity of sars cov2 to human ace2 characterized by spr in this experiment we will done this with the help of we will represent this by showing graphical representation in this graph graphical representation we will confirm the values by using michaelis maintain constant and the third one is based on the structure we will decide the comparison of this variant structural comparison of wt rbd and human ace2 and each sars cov2 variant rbd and human ace2 in this we we can find this by seeing the structure of the given molecule with the help of this structural comparison the cation and pi to pi interaction of hydrogen bond will shown in this experiment and the finally entry of sars cov2 variant pseudo virus into the hu7 cell in this we will confirm the electric charge charges and poles between the pi bonds and it finally the molecular features of variant rbd binding to human ace to provide valuable information by helping us and understanding the entry mechanism of sars cov2 variant and aiding in the development of novel vaccine and specific drugs that target the sars cov2 variant in the entire process at last the result of pseudo particles infection indicated the entry of beta and gamma variant were partially or fully resistant to antibodies by using for covid-19 treatment and the conclusion is our findings provide important molecular information and may help the development of novel therapeutic and prophylactic agents targeting the emerging mutant thank you ma'am thank you thank you so much hindu does anybody have questions for ms hindu all right if there are none we will go ahead thank you our uh, next thank you our next presentation has three authors uh, three participants on it glory nilesh and uh, mahender because this we are limiting the time to just three minutes we will only allow if uh, one of the participant to speak i am sure this was already conveyed to you yesterday um if whoever would like to present can raise your hand then i will unmute you all right thank you so much glory you now have access to unmute yourself please yes, remember you only have 3 minutes okay ma'am thank you thank you good afternoon to everyone respected dignitaries and the organizers of the webinar and uh, the poster presentation was presented by chusen glory singhadasri kamde nilesh Mah dr mind alini sir and dr grama mm kasula department of biotechnology telangana university nizam bar ts india and the poster was uh, the title of the poster was nanoparticle applications and impact on dna manipulation and action 
Nanoparticles play a crucial role in the uh, nanobiotechnological sciences as they are the integration of nanoscale, sci nanoscale science and, and engineering with the fundamental biological disciplines at various levels. So by using of this nanos uh, nanoscale uh, nanoparticles at uh, various levels you in the uh, biosciences as, the, as these are in a dimension between approximately one to 100 nanometer in size where unique phenomena enables the novel applications. So the applications are here, the agriculture applications and medicine applications, industrial applications, and some of the genotoxic effect of these nanoparticles. Now coming to the first application, agriculture applications leads to enhancement of plant bioactive compound productions like the secondary metabolite and plant genetic engineering and management of insect pest biocontrolling agents and non transgenic delivery system into chloroplast enhance growth and productivity. So next coming to the medicine applications of these nanoparticles. Uh, by using nanoparticles, we can also treat the cancer diagnostic and the site-specific uh, delivery systems and CRISPR-Cas uh, therapeutic studies and high sensitivity and selective COVID-19 diagnosis also uh, can be done by using these nanoparticle applications. And coming to the industry applications, by using this nan uh, nanoparticles, we can also uh, treat the wastewater treatment and food processing and packing and bioremediations of industrially effluents and nano and uh, production of uh, nano biofertilizers to reduce the uh, pesticides in the farming and to enhance the crop field. So by this, nanoparticles play. Uh, nanoparticles are uh, uh, nanoparticles can be utilized and uh, can and uh, nanotechnology uh, by by using nanotechnology which consists of processing of separations and consolidation and, and deformation of materials by one atom to one atom or from a molecule. So by this, we can conclude that uh, the, na the, the, the nanotechnological applications may be, uh, may be used at, uh, for, her, for other head as they have been uh, smaller in size. We use because of these unique properties as they are small in size, unique physiological properties like a genetic transformation, somatic embryogenesis, organogenesis, somatronal variations, eliminate the microbial contaminations at various levels in agriculture field. So therefore, uh, Therefore, the profound effect of nanoparticles on uh, DNA ac action need to be well investigated to minimize the genetic uh, xenotoxic effects or epigenetic effects like uh, DNA methylation and uh, gen uh, gene sensing and epigenetic effects and histone modification, non-specific gene expression patterns. Then, uh, and the- uh, Glory, hi. Thank you. Yes, Thank you so much for the presentation, but uh, time's up, so I'm gonna have to cut you short. Okay. Does anyone Thank have questions? Uh, does anyone have questions for Glory and her team? Okay, uh, Glory, is this a review article that you are presenting or your PhD research work? Review article, ma'am. The review article. Okay. Yes, so, where are the authors? Ma'am. Okay, fine. Fine, fine. Thank you. Thank you, Glory. Thank you very much. Right, so our next right. uh, participant is Shravanti. She's from Mahindra Hills College. Shravanti, uh, just raise your hand so that we can unmute you. You'll have three minutes to explain your poster. Good afternoon, This is Shravanti from Biotechnology from PSWRDC Mahindra Hills College. The title of my presentation is RBC Cells Function as DNA Sensor. RBC serves as immune sensor by expressing pro like receptor 9. They bind to CPJ containing bacterial, malarial, and mitochondrial DNA. During infection, number of such RBCs increases, which enhances the erythrophagocytosis leading to activation of innate immunity. The detection of DNA by RBC and immune clearance provides evidence during pathological stage. Anemia is common in disease condition and is poorly understood. Here in this paper, Arthur, Arthur identified one of the mechanisms showing RBC binding to cell-free DNA. So the first figure describes the DNA binding to mammalian RBC through surface expression surface express toll like receptor 9. 
RBC of salt like receptor 9 expression and RBC bound to CPG and elevated in human sepsis found CPG containing mitochondrial DNA and RBCs during parasitic infection, pneumonia and polymicrobial sepsis. The reveal that CPG containing to RBCs was sufficient to cause accelerated clearance in nerve mice. This may have implications for malarial pathogenesis since excess parasite DNA in the plasma of infected individuals may result in the removal of destruction of both infected and uninfected RBC. So in mice, CPG TLR9 interactions have been shown to promote inflammatory anemia during blood stage of infection and nucleic acid sensing toll-like -like receptor promotes anemia in a homophagocytic lymphophagocytic model. The findings from this study provide one mechanism by which RBC undergo accelerated clearance in section. Targeting RBC toll like receptor 9 with blocking antibodies or antagonic small molecule inhibitors may be visible option to combat inflammatory anemia. The data demonstrate that RBC south side DNA sensor through surface expression of toll like receptor 9 which appears to be beneficial during vision stage, where it promotes scavenging of trans levels of CPG to prevent non-specific inflammation. The innate immune mechanism may be beneficial in the clearance of microbial infection and damaged RBCs. CPG binding by RBCs likely contributes to systemic inflammation and development of anemia during pathologic phase, where cell free DNA is elevated. Thus, DNA recognition by toll like receptor 9 in RBCs provide bona fide evidence for RBCs as immune sentinels. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Shravanti. Uh, anybody has a question to ask, Shravanti? The jury can ask the question. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Next, we have uh, Anusha, who is a uh, research scholar from the Department of Biotechnology, Telangana University. I request Shiva to unmute Anusha. Dana. A very warm good afternoon to all the dignitaries present for the nat international conference. And uh, I'm very much thankful to Praveen sir and uh, all the members for giving me this golden opportunity to present my work. Uh, my name is Mrs. Uh, B. Anusha. I'm uh, doing my PhD under supervision of uh, Praveen Mamidala sir and I am DST Inspire JRS. Uh, my presentation, uh, my poster presentation uh, today is about the Molecular characterization of odor processing genes of Scytopopheca insectulans. It is a serious insect pest. It is a uh, rice pest, which is which is damaging. Almost 10 to 60 percent of yield loss is done alone by this Scytopopheca insectulans. And as it is monophagous, uh, whatever the uh, development now uh, they are doing on this part is uh, uh, um, Till date, the uh, till date there is no uh, information on YSP olfaction. So the uh, I have taken few I have selected few genes from my antenal transcriptomic data. I have selected few genes odor processing genes from my antenal transcriptomic data, uh, and uh, these uh, odor processing genes are categorized into two: that is odor binding proteins and odor degrading enzymes. Odor binding proteins are the ones which help in olfaction mechanism totally and odor degrading enzymes are also participating in the olfaction mechanism in degradation and this will pass the detection of ester pheromones, compounds and plant volatiles in insects. After selecting these genes, the, the main purpose of uh, doing the molecular acquisition of these things is um, to know the function, its structure and what next can be done by uh, by using this as a basis or a platform. In this procedure, I have uh, selected my gene of interest and I have uh, um, 
run in a tool expressly where I have translated my nucleotide sequence to protein sequences. From there, I have found ORF finder that is open reading frame in ORF finder. Later, the protein sequence was compared by using a tool, bioinformatic tool, BLAST, where the uh, query sequence, which is there, it is being um, compared to all the uh, all the se uh, protein sequences which are similar to uh, similar to the query sequence and after that i have collected the sequences which are showing the homology and i have aligned them by using a multiple sequence tool a multiple sequence alignment to cluster omega and doing this um, uh, multiple sequence alignment we can access the sequence conservation of protein domains their secondary and the tertiary structures and even individual amino acids or nucleo uh, uh, nucleo Types. Later, from this, I have constructed a phylogenetic and uh, phylogenetic tree, and this has revealed the start. Uh, this is very much useful for me to study the evolutionary development of a species of an organism and its particular characteristics, and it shows the lineage and it's uh, it, about its uh, ancestry. Next, coming to it, uh, con uh, coming to the signature motifs and the conservative ami uh, conserved amino acids. These signature motifs, which are there. These are mostly uh, used. Uh, these are the amino acid sequence patterns which are widespread and they can assume to have a biological significance. After that, I have, after getting the total protein sequences and their uh, structure and uh, multiple sequence alignment, I have, uh, uh, I have uh, um, predicted its secondary structure by using a bioinformatic tool, protein structure prediction, PSI, Red, and I have also found it's a molecular weight by using the embossed pepstein. Excuse uh, pepstein. me, Anusha. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to have to uh, stop you here because we are uh, past time. So does anybody from the jury have any questions? Dr. Jagdish, would you like to ask anything? Oh, great. I could I could unmute now. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. That's my fault. No, uh, I, I'm more curious to ask, like, what is this uh, Sirfofaga insert? Uh, no? Insectulas. Insectulas. Yeah, what sir, is what it is, is the uh, monophagous insect, sir, which is mostly affecting the rice fields and it is okay. causing almost 10 to 60 percent of yield loss to the farmers every year. OK, OK. So you did bioinformatic analysis now. And then if you want to proceed with the next steps, what would you like to do? So I'll go further, go for its a validation and a RNA studies, sir. Lockdown of these genes, order processing genes. OK, great. All the best. And thank you so much, sir. Yeah, our next uh, participant is Nisi from Mahindra Hills College. Please raise your hand, Nisi, so that we can unmute you. Yeah. Good afternoon, ma'am. Myself, I'm in Nisi from Mahindra from Telangana Social Welfare. Degree and PG College, Mahindra Hills. Title of my presentation is An Isothermal Amplification Based Coil of K Diagnostic Platform for the Detection of Mycobacterium Tuberculosis, a proof of concept study. Here, the author demonstrated the development of a segment direct rapid diagnostic method for, for tuberculosis. This consists of an isothermal amplification device called TINY. It is, it is abbreviated as TINY Isothermal Nucleic Acid Quantification System. This technique is established over TINY using PUCID amplification vector carrying IS6110, the target DNA sequence for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Diagnosis of tuberculosis is essential to initiate treatment and implement infection control measures. However, not all the TB causes are successfully identified. Puta microscopy is the most commonly used diagnostic method for tuberculosis in TB laboratories. 
in this in this oral fashion oral fat is taken and kept in the sterile water and healthy reaction is healthy reaction is used and prepared and this and next it is kept in and next it is kept in the tiny instrument and next we can we can see the graph through real time monitoring the next the graph um, graph is represented as Uh, limit of detection of HDI in tiny further detection of an IS is double one zero. The tenfold serially diluted UCID AMP vector carrying IS is double one zero ranging from two point five into one not nine copies were subjected to HDI in tiny in triplicate. The lowest copy number of IS is double one zero that could be one not five copies for UL in for six point five. Less or minus one point two minutes. That is less than fifty minutes special time. A uh, HDA in tiny for microbacterial pain. Um, thank you, Nissi. Uh, but I'm going to have to stop you now because uh, time's up. Okay. Does anyone from the jury have any questions for Nissi? Okay. If not, then we can go ahead. Thank you Thank very you. much, Nisi. Thank you. So, what we have next is Joshna, who's also from Mind Rails. Joshna, yeah. Yes, you can unmute yourself. I've already given you access. Good afternoon, ma'am. And uh, please do not read out. Just give us the summary of uh, the paper that you are presenting. And remember that you have only three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Firstly, thank you for giving me this opportunity. And my presentation is about determination of DNA lesion bypass by using a chip-based assay. And we know DNA lesion bypass plays a critical role in. Uh, Uh, cell survival after cell damage. So we developed chromatin immunoprecipitation method to determine the activity uh, DNA lesion activity by in using uh, cisplatin intraspin crosslink uh, in cancer cells. And we have conducted experiment. Uh, first experiment is about development of chip based assay lesion bypass assay with sonication. Uh, So in this method, uh, DNA polymer, uh, DNA polymerase, uh, the replicated DNA polymerase uh, encounters the DNA lesions. Uh, so DNA polymerase is replaced by a normal DNA. A newly synthesized DNA is formed here. Uh, the DNA, uh, the chromatin which is present in the DNA is uh, broken into small fragments by sonication method. Uh, then it is precipitated, uh, precipitated, and this. Uh, uh, This is transferred to subjected to a immunoblock protein, uh, and then BRDU and PDGG in a immunoprecipitate were determined using immunoblock protein with their corresponding antibodies. This data indicates that this may, this procedure can be used to validate newly synthesized DNA co coexisting with cisplatin in used DNA lesions. So in in figure two we notice the lesion bypass efficiency in sonicated SIPOH cells in D is not same in the figure two. Thus we use MNA dilution instead of sonication in subsequent experiments assessing lesion bypass efficiency. So in figure three the DNA immunoprecipitated with the anti PTGC antibody was treated with Expo H then subjected to immunoblock coating. For the analysis of BRDU and PTGG, the ratio of the BRDU intensity relative to the corresponding PTGG in SIPLH cells in SIC cells calculated to represent the relative lesion bypass efficiency in the SIPLH transfected after exposure treatment. So we conclude this method. In this method, the size of DNA fragments is critical to the sensitivity of the assay. By using MNS dilution to reduce the fragment size to around 100 to 200 base pairs, and using the XO8 to remove lesion bypass 
independent of BRDU, incorporated DNA adjacent to the five prime end of bypass patches opposite to the cisplatin induced crossing. We successfully reduce the non specific background, making it easier to detect minor changes in the lesion bypass activity. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jyotsna, for making this presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Would anybody like to ask any questions? I have, I have a basic question, Jyotsna. Maybe I missed, like, what is DNA bypass? Like, what are you bypassing? It's a... It's taking over. It's okay, fine, fine. Very well presented. Thank you, sir. I don't seem to be able to hear her. Right, we have the last presenter for the poster, for Sheikh Muhammad Anju. He's pursuing his master's in pharmaceutical sciences in Sage University, Malaysia. If you are there, please raise your hand. Anju. Hello. Yes. Good evening, everyone, including panel members and all the participants in this webinar. Uh, firstly, thank, thank you to the panel members for allowing me to present here in this wonderful international conference. My topic for today is uh, elucidating the role of hepcidin in colorectal cancer. So the objectives of this review study was to know the role of hepcidin in colorectal cancer, especially the HAMP gene, hepcidin antimicrobial peptide gene, and to also elucidate the effects of phytic acid, which is IP6, ionacetol 6 phosphate, in modulating the same gene expression. So generally colorectal cancer, uh, it's like it begins in the colon or the rectum. It's generally a formidable health issue worldwide. So this is the reason why I have selected for uh, making the review on this, especially on this article. Generally, the hepcidin manipulation within the tumor cells is of great interest because hepcidin and iron regulation within the cancer cells is very regulated more number of or more amount of iron into the cancer cells, which means uh, in more aggressive way, the cancer becomes because as we all know, iron is important component in the replication process. And it is also a cofactor in many enzymes, which is helpful for the amplification of the gene or for the division of the DNA. And it also helps in the cancer metastasis. So here we are going to elucidate how, by making a hypothesis, how iron and hepcidin are interrelated and how phytic acid is going to inhibit the hepcidin expression. Generally, the iron status within the cell is interrelated with the bone morphogenic protein, which we call BMP6. And here, the BMP6, BMP2 are co-regulated uh, with the iron overload by binding with hemojubilin protein. It initiates the SMAT pathway. And this SMAT pathway, uh, it regulates within the HAB gene expression. So generally this hexaphosphate, which is a myonacetol bioactive compound, it has affinity to form complexes with uh, polyvalent cations, including iron. So in this way, it interferes with the intestinal absorption mainly. So it is like when the hepcidin expression or the hepcidin amount within the blood or in the cancer environment, when it is high, it destroys the ferroportin. Ferroportin is a protein especially that doesn't allow the iron to go out of the cells. So this is how hepcidin controls the efflux of the iron. It doesn't allow the iron to go out and it conserves the iron within the cells. So when iron is conserved within the cell, it makes a more progressive a metastatic pathway or also it helps in progression of the cancer cell division. So uh, I'll tell you the gist of this project, why selecting this project for this respective conference is 
really the small molecules is what makes enthralling or exciting it can be for any disease it all starts with a small molecule so when we go into research with these small molecules uh, it can it can find a cure for greater diseases like cancer so this is the reason selecting this perspective review for this project and we have made a hypothesis how vasculo endothelial growth factor receptors are also involved uh, in this HAMP gene expression. This vasco, I mean, vascular endothelial growth factors, they help in binding with the PI3K pathways so that AKT signaling is also modified and also signal transducer act uh, activating receptor also uh, present in this pathway where all together with the help of interleukin-6 can help in reducing the HAMP gene expression. So IP6 is found to be inhibiting AKT, STAT, and all uh, mentioned pathways in this diagram, thereby inhibiting finally the HAMP gene. So this hypothesis states that if the HAMP gene expression is reduced, the iron intake or the iron efflux will be increased so that iron will be minimally available within the cancer or tumor uh, environment. Thank you, yes. Um, thank you so much, Anjum. I was just about to stop you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank does you. anyone have uh, questions for Anjum? Anjum, Anjum, what are you studying? Yes, yes, sir. I'm doing my master's in pharmaceutical sciences, MPS, sir. Oh, great. I mean, very beautifully articulated. And um, as you said, like smaller molecules, yes, do the big sir. thing. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Like um, one of my Indian friends has forwarded about this. So okay. within, within no time, I've been ready for this. I've made this within 30 minutes or something. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yes, sir. I mean, I'm I'm sure that if you have more time, you'll 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 come up with your own hypothesis. But, yes, but keep up yes. the good work. Yes. Very well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. Yes, so. Anjum, a uh, very good explanation. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Anjum, I just have one question. Like yes. uh, iron is also a cofactor for various antioxidants too. So, like uh, the way you are targeting iron in uh, cancer therapy. Uh, would it yes. have implications yeah. in like you are also causing an imbalance in the ROS and the antioxidant levels? Yes, yes, so yes. Can you okay. just throw some light yes. on it? Yes, yes. That is the reason why we are not targeting iron. So the main uh, elucidation here is we are going with the hepcidin. When we target the hepcidin, in that way, iron is being reduced. So we are not directly targeting on iron. We are modulating iron where we are modulating, sorry, we are modulating hepcidin where indirectly through STAT pathway or through AKT signaling, the iron pathways are being modulated. So indirectly, we are affecting the iron a composition within the cancerous cell. Right, okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. So with that, we are done with the poster presentations. Uh, I think we can quickly move ahead with the sci art. Yeah. most exciting session of the day. Yeah, very beautiful uh, arts we have received and uh, which depict a lot. I, I believe the participants will speak more on it. So quickly, let's start off. So first we have Supriya. If you are there, please raise your hand, Supriya. Good afternoon, all the team members and all the participants. A very good afternoon to everyone. And today is my topic. I have chosen the COVID-19 vaccine research work. In this, uh, we have gone through the mRNA, which is a genetic material that tells our body how to make the protein by using all the cell machinery. First, understanding the virus that causes COVID-19. Actually, co coronavirus, like uh, one of the COVID-19 named the uh, crown like spikes on their surface called spike proteins. These proteins are main targets to design these vi virus. And 
uh, the vaccine is made of mrna wrapping with a coating that makes delivery easy and keeps our body from damaging it and how does this virus work is the mrna yeah. in the virus teaches our cells to make copies of these spike proteins if you are exposed uh, to the real virus latter your body recognizes and fights it and knowing the all the uh, that antibody is produced already when we have vaccinated so the process is already inserted in our body by fo by following that our body re re uh, responds to our immune uh, to against this uh, covid virus and produces immunity to our body um and in this iad the middle center uh, is a lady that showing all the consequences of uh, pandemic situation from the laboratory scientific work towards the, all the research aspect aspects um, to synthesize the mrna these mrnas are um, created in the laboratory to teach our cells how to make a protein is, is that you supriya in the middle <laughs> no sir <laughs> beautiful very nice ma very nice next we have art by ramani who is a faculty in uh, manchurial college seven if you are there please raise your hand ma'am can you hear me ma'am yes yes please go ahead uh, good evening everyone a, a very good evening to all, all all the dignitaries delegates teachers and all the students in this meeting i pranavi lecturer in zoology working in tswrdc manchuriel would like to speak a few words on the art which i have presented in the program 150 years of dna conference so my art reveals about the heredity how dna helps in transmitting the characters if you if we go through the art we can see the symbols which is representing the female hand and a male hand from there we can so here we'll be seeing that the male dna and the female dna are trans replicated replicated and after the fertilization half of the uh, character from the male and half of the character from the female is transmitting to the baby and here uh, as per the present science and technology the dna is considered uh, in the forensic technology scientists we scientists use the dna profile to identify criminals and to determine the parentage that means the paternity testing as in the morning schedule of our zoom meeting as dr rakesh mishra sir said it is very much likely to say that the dna the thread of the life so uh, i would like to present in this art thank you very interesting very interesting art thank you, you can actually see the thread of life there <laughs> thank you madam uh -huh. but ma'am i have a small thing to say sorry to say this ma'am actually my name is not pravani it is pranavi no Oh. Okay, I, sorry for the mispronunciation. No, I I no problem, understand. Madam, doesn't matter. <laughs> no, I understand the confusion because we have been. They have been. My team has been talking a lot with me. So Pavani okay. has become Pavani. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, ma'am. No problem. It doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, madam. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. So next we have Shivani, who is pursuing her final year biotechnology. please raise your hand shivani good afternoon 
good afternoon everyone thank you for giving this wonderful opportunity myself i am shivani kapukar i am pursuing bsc biotechnology nizamba telangana now i would like to present my sci art on the topic of dna now you can see the detailed information in my sci art picture what which i presented now dna is the molecule that stores genetic information it stores genetic information and it is made up of nucleotide nucleotide and it it has three parts sugar phosphate and nitrogen bases and dna is a two standard molecule dna has a unique double helix shape like a twisted ladder each strand is composed of long sequence of the four bases that is adenine thionine cytosine and guanine the bases on one strand of the dna molecule pair together with complementary bases on the opposite strand of dna to form the rungs of the dna ladder the bases always pair together in the same way that is adenine with thiazine thiamine and cytosine with guanine each base pair is joined together by hydrogen bonds and here each strand of dna has a beginning and an end called 5n 5 prime and 3 prime now here the two strands run in the opposite direction to each other so that one runs 5 prime to 3 prime and one runs 3 to 5 prime so they are called the end strand and the anti end strand here the strands are represent during only dna replication so here we can see that a specific section of dna that code for it rate is called gene so the human genome is made up of 3.2 billion bases of dna but other organisms have different genome sizes here the double x like structure was first discovered by franis crick and james weston in the year 1950 i think 1953 DNA is also known as blueprint of life because DNA includes the instructions needed for an organism to grow, develop, live, and reproduce. And here, uh, DNA is located in nucleus because nucleus is the most important structure in cell reproduction because it is a blueprint which determines shape, size, and and it also repairs the each cell. Thank you so much, Shivani. Thank you, ma'am. thank you shivani i like the little lines that you wrote apples in trees and cars in garages so the apples. school children yeah yeah the school children you have joined if you have confusion on base pairing remember this apples are always on trees and cars are in the garages so a pairs with t and c pairs with g yeah. thank you shivani for, uh, for teaching that shortcut <laughs> i wish you taught me long time shivani i wish you taught me that when i was in batch <laughs> thank you sir thank you so much the next is vaishnavi can you please raise your hand vaishnavi vaishnavi are you there please move on to the next yeah. participant uh yeah okay so i see vaishnavi's name here i see vaishnavi deshetty name here in the, the next panel. is akansha uh, reddy who is pursuing her bachelor's in microbiology from chaitanya dean to be university yeah and Ma'am, am I audible? Yes, please. Hello. Yes, you are audible. You can go ahead. Okay. Okay. Warm afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Akanksha Reddy. I'm and I'm from Chaitanya Dean to be University. Um, and the theme of my artwork is DNA in all living things. So, if a question arises like, "What is the common thing noticed in every organism?" the answer given will be the molecular instruction of life called the DNA. Hence, DNA is referred as the building block of all the life on Earth. So, uh, coming to my artwork, uh, in this, the strands make up a man's face and the helix containing organisms. Uh, many of these organisms has been used in genetic research. Uh, like sheep has been cloned 
pigs have been genetically modified so that their organs can be transplanted into humans. Fruit flies are used to study effect of genes. Yeast have been used to produce human DNA for human genome project. Uh, so the DNA ties us all together from bacteria to man. And the more we looked at DNA, the more we realized that it's nature and nurture. And finally, uh, my artwork depict, depicts the artistic and visual form of the DNA. Thank you. Oh, amazing work, Akanksha. Really, really amazing. I mean, uh, I saw the picture uh, when I was shortlisting, but uh, after you explained, uh, it makes even more sense. Uh, it's, I think it's a very good thought and uh, you should explore a career in science illustration. If you want uh, Dr. Jagdish here or myself, we can connect you with some good mentors who are currently working in science illustration and science communication. I think you'll have a really good place there. You have a good vision. Keep it up. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add on to that. I mean, I'm also more curious to know how did you get all these ideas? Great. Uh, so Akansha is not able to speak. She's not able to unmute. But I just okay. Let's let's move on. Uh, very well, well done, Akansha. Yeah. Next is Ms. Ma Amreen from uh, Government Degree College for Women, Begum Pet. Amreen, please raise your hand. Good afternoon, everyone. Ma'am, I am audible. Yes, I'm ready. Okay. <clears throat> Myself, Ms. Baumring, I'm a second year student from Government Degree College for Women, Begampe. My site uh, shows a very simple descriptive view where the DNA is present. So the nucleus of a cell contains chromosomes, which are made up of DNA molecules. And each chromosome is made up of proteins and a single molecule of DNA and many proteins, which are called as histones. Chromosome are thread-like structures present in nucleus, which carries uh, genetic information from one generation to another. Uh, if we talk about the structure of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid is a molecule composed of two polynucleotide chains that call around each other to form a double helix carrying genetic instructions for the development, functioning, growth, and reproduction. And uh, the backbone of DNA is made up of sugar phosphate bonds. And in, uh, in, the, in the backbone of the uh, sugar phosphate, there are four nucleotides or bases in a DNA that is adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Uh, a base pair is a fundamental unit of double stranded nucleic acid consisting of two nucleic bases bounded to each other by hydrogen bonds. This hydrogen bonding patterns is also called as watson crick base pairs, that is guanine cytosine and adenine thymine, allow the DNA helix to maintain a regular helical structure that is dependent on its nucleotide sequence. Uh, this is a uh, uh, particularly important in DNA, RNA molecule, example, transfer RNA. Um, and, uh, and DNA is the uh, genetic material uh, for, of an organism and, uh, and, and the genetic material passed from parent to offspring and it serves as the information as direct. That's it now, thank you. Uh, well done, Ms. Ba Amrin. I mean, I really like the yellow corners in the in the chromosome. So that's where the you know the telomeres and all the things sits. And you could basically dedicate your life just working on that. <laughs> well done. Thank you, sir. Sure. Next we have Sai Ganesh. 
who is also from uh, Chaitanya deemed to be university. He is pursuing his bachelor's in uh, biochemistry. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, you can go ahead. Yeah. Good afternoon, one and all. This is Aganesh Verma from Deem to Be, Chaitanya Deem to Be Industry. Uh, DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. In the advancement of DNA technology, one of the things is gene therapy. What actually the gene therapy defines? If a child or an embryo is diagnosed to carry a defective gene leading to disability, one may like to correct this defective gene by replacement of defective gene with a normal gene or by correcting the defective gene through genetic targeting or by genetic augmentation, either through increasing the number of copies of the gene or through a higher level of expression of introduced gene. In recent years, approved human genetic engineering or gene therapy experiments have been conducted. These experiments include add a gene therapy. In the year 1990, the first trial of actual gene therapy was conducted in USA. A little four-year-old girl suffering with adenosine DMNS deficiency, a lethal disorder, was transfected with lymphocytes bearing the ADA gene carried by retroviral vector. In a similar way, in the year 2020, Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Emmanuel Carpentier of Max Planck Unit, Jennifer Dodna, CRISPR-Cas9 genetic seizures for genome editing. In this, the genome in the in this the desired genome will be edited and left for natural correcting by the help of Cas9 enzyme. In the advancement of DNA technology or gene therapy research, allow us to treat and hopefully someday avoid rare diseases. And thank you, ma'am, for this opportunity. Oh, very nice, Sai Ganesh. I really like the approach of, you know, it takes cell, uh, cells from the body, you make them into iPSs. Okay. iPSs are induced, induced pluripotent stem cells. You correct them and again inject them. And I also like the way that you want to first inject them into the mice. Uh, very well presented. Yeah, thank you, Sai Ganesh. So we are done with the posters and also the Sai art. So all the participants did a very good job. And hopefully we'll be announcing the winners uh, tomorrow. So please be connected, all the participants. So we can move ahead with our next session. Yeah, so next session. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Sumati, can I take over? Yeah, 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 yeah ma'am. You can, you can take over. Okay. So very warm good evening, all of you. It's nice to have over, you, over this Zoom platform. Since morning, we've been learning many things and it's all intellectual minds speaking over here. Hope you have been benefited. So DNA is called the blueprint of life because it contains the instructions needed for an Hello, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Uh, Purnima, ma'am. Uh, just... Yes, ma'am. Sorry to interrupt you. Please hold on for a minute. Oh. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I hope that, you know, this, I definitely know that the poster presentations and the SciArt display are actually a really good start to a post-lunch session. And I hope uh, they have all brought your attention back to these sessions. Our uh, first speaker post-lunch is actually Dr. Venu who is already here and he has also been active in the chat and been responding to the participants as well. So thank you, sir, for joining well ahead of time and for uh, observing what, uh, what are the different sessions we have in store. I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Sumati again to please introduce Dr. Venu. Yeah, very good afternoon. Uh, sorry that there's a power cut over my, over my place. I'm unable to turn on my video. So here, uh, our next speaker we have with us is Dr. Venu Tatikunda. He's here to speak on the topic, a panoramic view of omics in health and disease. Dr. Venu is a computational biologist with Boehringer Ingelheim. His journey begin, began with a bachelor's in pharmacy at the Kakatiya University and a master in pharmacoinformatics with the National Institute of Pharmaceutical Education and Research. 
after which he persevered to obtain a phd in bioinformatics with the german cancer research center he is passionate about building i mean bridging the knowledge gap in understanding cancer using larger scale genomics multi omics and machine learning approaches so dear delegates join me in welcoming dr venu so over to you dr venu may may i just interrupt before venu speaks so uh, the reason why we we picked venu is that venu is from telangana and uh, came from very humble background and and now he's pursuing you know he's doing some of the great works and when i asked him like would you would you give a short talk to telangana students he's like his energy was so infectious he want to translate his what he learned so nen telugu lo maatladutanu chellallu tammunlu evarana nijanga meeru science lo pursue chesko anukunte venu anna mi aadarsham a topic i talk aipena kuda venu nan kalisi meeru manchiga maatladandi venu go ahead yeah uh, thanks a lot jagdish and thanks everyone actually i was looking into these presentations i'm really really happy because because the students our bachelor students now are much much more smarter than when i was actually doing my bachelor's to people have really good access to everything and internet and they're much more exposed to different techniques in one of the last arts i saw crispr cas9 i was like wow people already know crispr cas9 during their bachelor time so i think you all you will all good really uh, do good work uh, in your upcoming years during your bachelor's and even master's and i am hope uh, i hope uh, some of you will even pursue phd's and do great science um, yeah when jagdish actually asked me to give a talk on the omics or dna uh, in general to to bachelor students uh, i was actually thinking about what i what exactly i have known during my bachelor's and uh, yeah i i tried to design the talk in a way uh, uh in a way that i provide you new, new information on top of what you actually know so that you don't get overwhelmed by the new information but uh, at the same time you get an idea uh, what exactly is happening in the field of omics and how you can also break into the field uh, at the end of the talk i will give few tips uh, what you can do into get into this field and also pursue your career uh in terms of masters or or even phd's uh in terms of computational omics or in general omics and do disease related research so the the title of the talk is panoramic view of omics in health and disease so i will not go into uh techniques or technical details or different procedures experiments in detail but i will um provide you information in a way uh you will get an idea what is the omics and what are the different fields uh, within omics and what people are actually doing uh using these omics right yeah so before going into the details just a brief uh, introduction about dna how this dna is organized uh, in the cell so you guys were already know this how this uh, how this entire thing is organized in the cell uh, by looking at your posters and by looking at your arts so we 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 already known uh, there exists four bases apples on trees and uh, cars in the garage right that that was amazing uh, metaphor to remember at and gc so we have four uh, a uh, basis here and the dna is a double stranded uh, molecule and this dna is wrapped around uh, proteins called histones uh, these histones are really important uh, in in entire dna function and how the genes are expressed uh, in the human uh, genome uh, and this once this dna is wrapped around histones and this histone together with the dna is called nucleosome and this nucleosome uh, arrangement of nucleosome is called chromatin uh this entire chromatin is organized into chromosome right this is the entire arrangement of your dna in any any of the cell you take in your body and one more thing to remember here uh, important to understand the omics as a field is the central dogma of molecular biology right so you you guys were all uh, already familiar with central dogma of molecular biology so that dna is the contains the sequence information that means um entire information about you is contained in the arrangement of this dna sequence and this dna is transcribed into rna it produces mrna and this mrna is translated into protein so finally these proteins are the functional units and these proteins will carry out different functions in your body uh, every kind of phenotype that means how you look and what is your eye color what is your hair color 
and all these kind of things are done by these proteins. And omics is the field uh, composed of many, many different fields. So here it's, I have shown as a basic description, DNA to RNA to protein. So the things are done um, with DNA are called genomics and the things uh, that are done or experiments that are uh, done using RNA are called transcriptomics. And you can already imagine uh, with proteins, we call it proteomics, right? Let's talk about DNA now. So first, first DNA. So you, you already know yeah, DNA contains these sequences and it's got the all the experiments you do and all the information you get are purely using DNA or call, the field is called genomics. And the genomics is like basically identifying the sequence alteration. So meaning what kind, so what is the original sequence and how this sequence is altered? That means how this sequence is mutated and what is the downstream effect of these mutations? So all these things are composed into the field called genomics. Again, I'm really massively simplifying everything here so that you will get a basic idea what exactly the field and what is the core idea of genomics. Right. And here somebody already mentioned in the in one of the art presentations that we have three billion base pairs in the DNA. Yes, we have three billion base pairs in the DNA, but at the moment, only two percent of that genome codes for protein. So entire all three billion new, uh, base pairs are not resulting in a protein. Uh, only two percent of the entire um, genome, human genome is actually resulting in a protein. So that is very, very low fraction. But you can see in the following slide how complicated this is. Um, here I'm showing you one example, original sequence. This is original sequence. So when you, once you are healthy, let's say uh, your lungs are perfectly healthy. And if I take any cell in your lung, your sequence looks like this, for example. And this sequence actually codes for a protein that stops uncontrolled cell growth. So you, you are already familiar with cell cycle. And there is one protein uh, that actually stops cell cycle at one point so that you don't grow uh, more number of cells. Uh, so th this, this, this is the entire idea here. And let's say you somebody is smoking or somebody is inherited some mutations from their parents or they are exposed to different chemicals. So whatever the reason, there are many, many different kinds of reason why you get a mutation. Um, this is your mutated sequence. So instead of A, you got a C in one of your lung cells. And what happens with this? All of a sudden, uh, your protein becomes non-functional. So this um, correct sequence produces a protein and the incorrect sequence also produces a protein. But the difference between these two proteins is one protein is functional, other protein is non-functional. So here you don't have any stop sign on the cell cycle. So cells are growing uncontrolled. Uh, there is no control over cell cycle. So that's how you get a very big tissue of cells that becomes cancer. Right. So this is the whole idea behind identifying mutations and, and also the field of genomics. And one famous example, if you just Google TP53 mutations in cancer, you will, you will see how this entire process is happening in terms of mechanisms and every detailed step. Even if you go to a Wikipedia page about TP53, they'll explain very nicely what is the mechanism behind it. But whole idea behind identifying the sequence alterations and the genomics is to identify what proteins are actually helping to helping tumor to grow and what proteins are actually uh, protecting you against growing a tumor and we identify all those things in the in the field called genomics so that's the entire idea of genomics uh, let's move on to rna now right so you, you you already know from DNA, we produce RNA. So RNA is a single-stranded uh, molecule. And here imagine, so uh, as, as I mentioned in earlier slide, so we have like 3 billion uh, base pairs uh, uh, in the DNA, but as said, only 2% of the genome codes for a protein. So these proteins are actually coming from genes. And within genes, you already have, again, very different kinds of locations. That, that is like intronic region, exonic regions, UTR regions. But here the protein is actually coming from exonic regions. So these exonic regions actually produces a protein. So here, just to illustrate you, uh, this is the entire DNA, the black line. And in one location, we have a gene here in the red. And this gene is expressed a lot in healthy cell. Uh, 
Uh, and what what do we do now? So we, we basically take RNA and then maybe convert it to DNA and the sequence the DNA. I think you already have introduced uh, to uh, sequencing technologies in one of the talks, or if not, please don't worry about it. Just uh, know that uh, starting from RNA, you can measure uh, gene expression in the cell. And what people do is just uh, take this RNA and sequence it and identify in each tissue which genes are highly expressed, which genes are not expressed. Which, uh, just imagine if a gene is expressed, that means that gene has very important function in the tissue. That's the simple idea. And now, so let's say again, taking the lung, uh, your lung cell as the example. So your healthy lung has uh, uh, this gene and this gene is expressed a lot. And all of a sudden, you got some kind of lung disease. And in the disease, uh, you lost this gene's expression here. There is no expression of this gene. So you can imagine a situation. So this gene is actually important for my normal lung function because that's why it is expressed a lot. And I have got some lung disease. All of a sudden, this gene's expression is lost. So you can identify, especially these kind of genes, which were actually important in normal cases, but lost their expression in disease cell. So if you can identify these kind of genes, you can already imagine what to do exactly with this. What is this protein uh, that is resulting from this gene? Uh, how can we target this protein uh, or in, to increase the expression of the protein? Or you can imagine exactly the opposite case. Right, And in a healthy cell, this gene is not at all required. So again, same example uh, with the lung. In my, so my healthy lung has no expression of this gene. So it is not at all uh, important for my lung function. And I've got a disease, lung disease. And all of a sudden, this gene is expressing very crazily. It's, and the resulting protein is uh, uh, active very crazy. And it's doing every function possible. That means, so this protein, resulting from this gene is very active. So you can imagine somebody was actually talking about SIRNA mediated knockdown or CRISPR mediated correction or CRISPR mediated knockdown, these kind of things. You can think about this in future if you know what kind of genes are actually important in the disease cell compared to healthy cell. So again, uh, here you have overexpressed genes, you have less expressed genes compared to your healthy cell. And one famous example is MYC expression in cancer. MYC is one of the genes produces MYC protein. And this is really, really crazily important in cancer. So many, almost uh, out of all cancers, you can imagine more than 50% of the cancers are actually driven by MYC, MYC overexpression. Meaning you can imagine when I say overexpressed in cancers, it is actually not very important in healthy cell, right? And that's the whole idea behind the transcriptomics, identifying genes that are aberrantly active or that are differentially active compared to healthy cell. And then building upon those uh, information you get out of this transcriptomic, you can imagine different technologies or you can even imagine if you are a chemistry student, how to target this protein, what is the protein structure, how, what are the binding pockets for this protein, how can we use existing molecules to target this protein so that your disease will be controlled or even you, are, you completely become a healthy person from deceased person. This is, that is the entire idea behind transcriptome, transcriptomics. And now let's move on to something called proteomics. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, DNA to RNA, RNA to protein. And these proteins are the actual functional units. And here in this figure, uh, as you can see, in the genome, roughly you have 20 to 25,000 genes. It's not even 25,000, it's a upper limit we have at the moment, but roughly say 20,000 genes. So that means the, the, the analysis or the, the imagination you can have around 20,000 genes is little easier, but from, again, uh, from these uh, 20,000 genes to you roughly end up with 100,000 or 1 lakh transcripts. We, there are different ways, biological uh, mechanisms that exist in our body that produce different kinds of transcripts or uh, different kinds of, let's say, uh, genes, gene variations, because uh, 
because at some point you need high function of a gene at some point you need very low function of a gene depending on the requirement evolution has already created these mechanisms in our body to produce different kinds of transcripts even here one lakh transcripts yeah you use very sophisticated computers and you do all the analysis using this transcriptomics data that's still a little less complicated if you go further so as we are moving on to proteins it it gets much more complicated meaning so one let's say one gene produces one protein uh, in the ideal case but here what happens is each protein has a so you already know proteins are composed of amino acid residues and each of the amino acid or if not each of the amino acid many many amino acids are actually prone to different kinds of modifications chemical modifications for example here i have given one example so lysine residues are actually prone to acetylation so depending on these modifications protein function actually changes so what do we do in proteomics so what in proteomics we try to measure not uh, not all the kind all the proteins that are available in the body because we don't know how many or uh, proteins are actually active in the body but at least a, a subset of those proteins we try to measure the abundance of those proteins meaning what is the quantity of a protein uh, in in a diseased cell compared to normal cell then we compare which proteins are highly active in the cell uh, diseased cell compared to healthy cell and again the process continues uh, how can uh, you can imagine how to control the proteins activity and how to how to uh, increase certain proteins activity so here i, I see so here you can imagine greater than 1 million uh, or one crore proteins uh, 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 active in the in the human body and it gets even more complicated if you imagine so if you take one protein here on the top left corner uh, top left corner this protein is not active alone so it all it, it it always interacts with other proteins so if you take these interactions into consideration it it even gets more complicated this 10 uh, 1 million becomes even 10 million combinations uh, and uh, and it it it's get it gets complicated in a way to understand uh, what what uh, what is the role of these combinatorial activity on the disease so that uh, that's why the at the moment at least at the moment uh, the the field is much more rapidly uh, improving in the genomics and transcriptomics space and still people are working to improve the technologies around proteomics but but uh, at the moment the state of the art techniques like very sophisticated techniques are available uh, at the genomics and uh, transcriptomic uh, tra transcriptomic status uh, yeah this is the entire idea behind the proteomics measuring the quantities of protein now i will move on to something called epigenomics so it, it this is this is where it gets uh, much more complicated but i'll try to simplify in a way you get uh, a very basic understanding and also in a way if you google something you will get some information to learn even more so epigenomics is something so epi means top uh, epigenomics means on top of genomics uh, so epigenomics actually includes uh, this is very interesting field I, uh, i've been working in this field from almost like uh, four to five years uh, to understand different things that are happening under epigenomics and in this epigenomics you identify certain situations where your sequence is not modified as in genomics but without actual uh, without modifying the sequence you get differential gene expression meaning you get different phenotypic effects uh, for example you have twins but they, the the twins are different in a way so let's say let's imagine their sequence is almost similar but the if you if you take any cell in their body and compare uh, between two two twins very different genes are active so that is actually coming from epigenomics even though if if um, if two um, people are twins one has black eye color one has let's say brown eye color so this is actually these things are coming from epigenomics and this epigenomics is a field is very interesting to think about so even the in, in you can even compare in your family so with your sibling with your sister so with your, your sister is uh, you, you you are very taller than your sister or or your sister is taller than you so these kind of things you can imagine what exactly might be happening in terms of epigenomics so i'll briefly tell you uh, what includes in the epigenomics and what you can even search uh, and know more about and learn more about uh, 
epigenomics. So uh, you already know uh, there are four uh, bases, uh, C, G, A, T uh, in, the, in, the, in the DNA and the cytosine molecule here, uh, cytosine base, uh, it is actually prone to DNA methylation, main, meaning uh, methyl groups are frequently added to these cytosines. Uh, there is very good evolutionary reasons why this methylation happens on the cytosine residues. That's, uh, it gets even more complicated if we, if we get into those details of evolutionary reasons. Uh, but just uh, as of now, just imagine, uh, just, just go with it that cytosine residues are prone to uh, methylation. So that methyl groups are added to the cytosine residues. And these methyl groups are really, really important and play a very good role uh, in, in, uh, in uh, defining a phenotype. That means, for example, how you look uh, compared to your siblings, or compared to your father, compared to your mother. Uh, and even, even between two things, uh, these the inner methylation patterns are very, very different. So there are, again, sequencing techniques, microarray techniques to measure these DNA methylations uh, in your DNA, uh, how these are present, uh, what is the frequency and what is the pattern of these uh, methylation. So there is roughly two patterns, either hypomethylation or hypermethylation. The, as the term uh, describes itself, hypo means very low methylation levels, hyper means very high methylation levels. And these methylation levels are actually highly correlated with the gene expression. So why? Because if you if you if you are familiar with the term euchromatin, heterochromatin, or or loose chromatin, tight chromatin, so these hypermethylation, uh, meaning when when methyl group is present on the cytosine, your your nucleosome that I described in one of the first slides are coming together very closely. There is no space between one nucleos uh, one nucleosome and the other nucleosome. So that's why there is no chance for other proteins to bind here and influence the gene expression. So hypermethylation is giving rise to less gene expression. And as opposed to hypomethylation, what happens in hypomethylation? You have one nucleosome and the other nucleosome. The distance between these two nucleosomes is very big. It's, they are, they are uh, positioned very apart so that you have very uh, free space here and in this free space, there are other proteins are coming and binding and therefore increasing the expression of these genes. That's the basic idea behind these DNA methylation patterns. So as I mentioned earlier, you might be taller than your, your sister or your sister might be taller than you. So you take those DNA methylation, you just collect your cells, cells from your sister and you and then do this DNA methylation analysis and see, oh, because of this pattern, I'm taller than my sister. You can do actually do these kind of things. So th these are the spaces, these are the events uh, that are giving uh, rise to different phenotypes. Phenotype meaning just how you look like and it's, it's a specific pattern. And the other uh, interesting field within epigenomics is chromatin accessibility. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this uh, DNA is compacted into chromatin. Uh, uh, here, uh, chromatin accessibility. There are, again, two patterns here, open chromatin and closed chromatin. So it goes along the same lines as DNA methylation patterns. So open chromatin means, again, your nucleosomes are very uh, situation, situated uh, uh, very distantly, and there is a very big space between two uh, nucleosomes, and then other proteins are binding here and influencing the gene expression, as opposed to closed chromatin. I think you already know now what is closed chromatin. So all these nucleosomes are coming together and there is no space and the gene is not expressed. That's the entire idea behind it. And the histone modification, this is very complicated field here. Uh, so I've mentioned uh, in one of the first slides, the DNA, our DNA is wrapped around these histone uh, proteins. These histone proteins are really, really important in the, in the regulation of uh, transcriptomics and the regulation of gene expression, um, to, to simply put it. So these histones are basically proteins. So me, meaning you can imagine these proteins are composed of amino acids. And as I mentioned, amino acid residues are prone to different modifications, different chemical modifications. Here I have listed three modifications, but uh, there are a ton of modifications. Um, and you know better than me because you, many of you are studying bi biochemistry and what is the effect of these chemical modifications. So some of the um, amino acid residues are estylated, some of the residues are methylated, some are ubiquitinated. So every different type of modification will give 
a different result on the gene expression. That's why it gets much more complicated. For example, here you can imagine you have a histone protein here, let's say H3 histone protein, and it has amino acid uh, residue, like a chain of residues. And on this residue, you have estylation. Because of this estylation, uh, the nearby genes are highly expressed because the estylation increases the open chromatin, right? And open chromatin means you can already imagine hypomethylation. So all these things are interconnected. That's why it gets much, much more complicated if you get into this field. But you will, uh, I'm sure you will learn uh, much more things uh, about this epigenomics if once you start uh, reading about these things, because uh, it's it's very interesting. And you can, so everything you learn about these things, you can actually see in real life uh, among your family members and among your friends. Um, how they are looking and how, how their hair is uh, uh, looking like. Is their hair very strong or very weak? These kind of things, these are all coming from epigenomics. And you can already talk to your friends uh, in terms of like sciencey stuff. Uh, next, next time you meet a friend, you just talk to him, ah, oh, your hair is looking very good. It must be epigenomics under the action. So these kind of things, it gets much more uh, fun, much more interested once you use this terminology in your daily life. So that's the that's that's the uh, uh, entire field of epigenomics here. Uh, now I will give you a little recap of what I've told you. I have told you about basic organization of DNA in the cell and what are the different kind of omics fields available at, at the moment. So genomics, genomics is basically identifying sequence alterations and what is transcriptomics? Transcriptomics identifying the gene expression changes. Proteomics, proteomics uh, is basically measuring the protein abundances and protein post-translational modifications. Epigenomics, uh, gene expression changes without actually modifying the uh, DNA sequence. So those are the different kinds of omics fields. And what is the current state of the field? What, what new technologies are coming up? So people are trying to develop single cell omics, meaning so the whole, all the technologies I have shown you here, they just collect the tissue and then just uh, take the average of all the tissue cells. Let's say if, if, I, uh, if somebody took a tissue from my lung, his lung is, come, let's say there are 100 cells. So at the end uh, with all these omics, average of 100 cells is um, measured. And what is the current state here now? So in the current state, people are actually looking into each single cell. If somebody collected my lung tissue, there are 100 cells. People are actually looking into each cell in, uh, individually. So that means uh, you kind of identify heterogeneity within my 100 cells that are present in my lung and what is their function, how they are behaved under different circumstances. And what other thing is going on in the field is combination of these omics with the CRISPR. Your CRISPR is already, most of you already know, most or many of you or all of you already know about the CRISPR, that precise gene editing is possible with CRISPR. So people are trying to understand so we, um, what is the gene function? So as I mentioned, there are 20,000 genes. And among those 20,000 genes, we know barely 5,000 gene functions. And there are, let's say, 15,000 other genes which we don't know what they are doing. So because we using this CRISPR technology, they precisely modify the gene uh, for which we don't know the function and then do the omics analysis and see uh, what exactly this gene is doing, what functions are modified once this gene is knocked down or once this gene is overactivated. So these kind of things are people doing currently in the field. Uh, now I would like to give you some basic tips how to get into this field. Uh, as a biology student, as most of you are biology students. So don't just think when I say biology, exactly studying biology. Biology means biochemistry, pharmacology, medicinal chemistry, all these things, because in every field, you actually learn the fundamentals of biology. So the, the main transcription, translation, what is protein, what is the alternate splicing, all these kind of things. These are actually, um, which I call fundamentals of biology. Uh, if you want to get into this, this field of omics or field of computational biology, field of bioinformatics. And slowly from then, once you get into the field, you can know what is happening, what people are using, what kind of different techniques available. For example, as already Jagdish mentioned, I've been working in the field of machine learning. So you actually training uh, machines to understand the biology uh, using all these omics data. 
so what was my uh, what was my uh, path to my current position yeah i mean i to be honest uh, i i can't say i know this uh, i will do all these kind of things when i was doing my bachelor's only when i look back i can connect all the dots right so i actually did uh, my bachelor's in pharmacy from warangal uh, i think oh i hope some of you are from warangal uh, it's a nice place uh, after my bachelor's i did my masters in pharmacoinformatics actually um, uh, uh, it's called uh, i cleared gpat and niper these are the two entrance tests to do pharmacoinformatics or masters so at this stage i actually learned uh, coding or programming on my own using the different uh, resources on the internet uh, this is i would say this is really a game changer once you learn coding this is really a game changer and many many opportunities will uh, will come to you uh, then once i had the coding i all as as i mentioned in every uh, field related to remotely related to biology you learn all the fundamentals of uh, biology uh, about dna rna proteins all these kind of things that means you have the biology knowledge and once you combine that with coding or programming you obviously become bioinformatician so informatics means you are you can code or program uh, bio means you already know biology so it's a combination of biology and informatics you 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 are a bioinformatician and then i applied for phd uh, and then i finished my phd uh, very recently from germany so this is this was my path again as i said don't worry if you don't know how to proceed further there are many many um, people who help you uh, like the organizers of this conference or if you just ask uh, on the internet anyone uh, they will definitely help you they will give you good resources uh, uh, this was my path and how how you can do it now so see, given that you, most of you are bachelor students uh, are studying um, uh, something related to biology so now you are a biology student uh, so any biology related field uh, the immediate thing i would suggest is learn coding so there are many many free resources uh, it's about the time you spent learning something there are many many resources i actually learned uh, coding from edx this is one website they offer courses online courses you just register and you find a free course and just try to finish that course that's the most important thing people start many people start something that they want to do but almost 90 to 95% people don't finish it that's where the difference between the winners and the losers right everybody starts everybody finishes even 50% but only a small fraction of people finish the uh, reach the finish line that's 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 where the opportunities are sitting once you reach a course uh, once you finish a course that means you are at the end of the course that you have a good knowledge of something when you finish a course it means means so we, when you are finishing bachelor's you completed three years or four years of a course that means you have very good understanding of the basic principles the bachelor level understanding of of the principles of the subjects you are studying and the same goes with the online learning so again as i said you guys are much much more smarter than me when i was doing my bachelor's uh, i didn't know all these resources i barely used youtube and i i didn't even have an email id now look at you you are already attending online conference online international conferences you are presenting posters and you are making sci uh, sci art illustrations these you guys are much much more smarter than me and 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 what i strongly suggest is put that smartness into one direction so that you you get proper output from your efforts uh, learn coding i can't really emphasize this enough just learn coding there are number of tutorials on youtube there are courses like up to 6 to 7 hours just daily spend one hour or weekly weekly two hours or three hours but try to finish that course and as soon as you think you finish the course just write to different professors that you want to work in their lab for three months or six months uh, if they pay, it's good. If they don't pay, try to find a find professor who can pay because because I I I know because I came from a background where money is not so good. 
uh, the lack of resources. I, I understand these things. If they pay, it's good. But if 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 you are in Hyderabad or, or somewhere close by where you have CCMB or um, uh, these kind of institutions, just if it's close by your home, just even without payment, just go and work in their lab for three months so that you understand what exactly people are doing in, in, in research labs. That's what, that's what you want to know. Um, yeah, as again, as I said, internships apply for masters and PhD programs. So once you do like three to six months internship uh, in the space where you learn coding and you also have biology knowledge, I'm telling you, people will come for you. Uh, they 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 want you. They because the the people who can do this are very very low number in 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 entire world. They, I mean, if if let's say hundred people are doing actual experiments, only like among those hundred five or seven people are doing can do this bioinformatics kind of analysis omics kind of analysis yeah so this is the path i would suggest but if you have any questions on top of this please feel free to re reach out to me and that's it from my side but before uh, ending the presentation uh, there are many many great people involved in my entire journey i'm really grateful to all of those people starting from kakadiya university where i did my bachelor's uh, in warangal and then niper uh, masters and uh, worked as a bioinformatician uh, at, uh, in Kolkata and then went on to doing PhD in Germany and now currently working at a company, a pharma company, which actually develops uh, drugs for cancers. So entire thing I explained here, that's exactly what I do, but in more detail, right? So that's, I just put forward everything in, a, in simple terms so that you get an idea and you also search on the internet what you can do possibly, right? And yeah, that's it from my side. And I hope you have some questions and you, I hope you got some information out of it. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Venu. And I think your uh, enthusiasm definitely caught on to the students, uh, especially when you mentioned about the career pathways that they have to take up and uh, how your journey has helped. I think that uh, really helped, would help them. And I'm sure a few of them will definitely get back to you with some questions. Yeah, 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 definitely. Please, please feel free to reach out to me if you want to know or if you want what kind of programming languages you want to learn or what are useful things to learn to get into this field. Please uh, feel free to reach out to me. Yeah, uh, Dr. Veno, that's very nice of you uh, to agreeing us to guide our students. But our yeah. next speaker for the session, Dr. Parvinder, uh, has already joined. So let us yes. move ahead with the schedule, but I'm sure I'll definitely trouble you again for your time for another session exclusively yeah. for the T-Sphery students uh, dedicated yeah. to career guidance, especially who yes. are interested in computers and who are ready to uh, explore a career in bioinformatics. Yeah. No, I, I take that as a promise from you on this public platform. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Veno. It was really energetic uh, because I was really worried about the post lunch session, but uh, your energy from your presentation actually took our hunger, uh, what, afternoon uh, sleep away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, may I now request uh, Purnima ma'am to introduce our next speaker? Yes. Uh, thank you, Shiva. So, good evening, all. After having a splendid session on Biogenomics by Dr. Venu. We will now move on to the next speaker. So we have DNA. DNA is called the blueprint of life because it contains the instructions needed for an organism to grow, to develop, survive, and reproduce. We now introduce you to our next speaker, who is the director of DNA Zoo Australia, leads translation in genomics research program expertise in working to translate the fundamental science into ready to use solutions across agriculture and medicine sections made substantial contributions to the field of biotechnology won many accolades for her work the superstar of stem at science and technology australia the champion in challenging and breaking the monotonous and stereotyped work, recipient of Artificial Intelligence Award 2019 DNA Zoom, Zoo Work, international ambassador to close the gender gap in the technology field, 
mentor for gender equity and girl extech let us now join hands and express that we are delighted to have her joining the conference not only to share her work and to impart the knowledge but to instill inspiration in our delegates and the young women who are part of this conference and pursue this as one of the passions we now welcome dr parvinder kau thank you madam the floor is now open to you a warm welcome to you thank you namaste everyone and thank you so much purnima for such kind words i'm i'm Pleasure really everyone. really uh, looking forward to share and talk to you all and also connect to you all so thank you so thank much you. for thank you. for the organizers as well to um, to organize such a wonderful uh, conference and celebrating dna as we celebrate 150 years of knowing dna which is also the blueprint of life so if may i request to share um, share my screen uh, if that's sure. okay thank you yes yes it's fine so are you able to um, can you just confirm if you're able to see my screen okay yes yeah super okay so my talk's title today is dna which is a blueprint of life but i thought let's give it a little bit more context than just being a blueprint of life it's actually an amazing amazing space or resolution at which we can understand quite a lot of things about life but at the same time we can also understand where we come from and how did we come from a single cell or the origins of life uh, here as well before i get started i would like to introduce you all to dna zoo program it is a global consortium across nine countries with more than 110 collaborating lab partners across the globe and my lab in um, in australia looks after the australia and the new zealand um, biodiversity or the species whereas this global consortium was founded from bella college of medicine and our lab and bella college of Med medicine lab our sister labs championing this work so with that i would like to move forward and acknowledge the land or the country from where i am connecting to all today so the land i am connecting to you today belongs to nonga people this is the southwest or the western australia where i'm speaking to you all and it's um it's on the other side of the melbourne and sydney so we are on the west a little closer to all of you and our time difference is only two and a half hours so i would like to acknowledge uh, these wonderful people who remain the cultural custodians of this land and i would like to pay my respects to their past present and emerging leaders okay i'm sure you've had a wonderful uh, wonderful few sessions today learning about dna but i if i was in person with you guys i would like to everyone to raise their hands and tell me who got fascinated by the fact of evolution and how many different forms of life we see around us and have you ever wondered while growing up or being a child that where did this all start from you know a lot of times we think that it all started from single cell it all started from big bang or you know so many other theories are out there but did it actually start from a single cell and if it did start from a single cell you know how did how did we turn into all these amazing creatures we see around us so to answer that question um i have always been very very curious and there has been two key biological mysteries which have motivated my entire career so far the first one is i'm sure you guys will agree with me that how a massive a massive code if you have to put dna as a code this is a an artistic drawing by mary ellen cherry of a D, of a nucleus and this um little uh snake like things you're seeing it's actually the dna of an organism sitting inside the nucleus so that's why we call it is genomes in space 
The Genomes in Space has a big context to solve one of the biggest biological mystery and how and where we originated from and how we are functioning if you look at it from this context. So DNA, we all know, if you stretch out a DNA from a one single nuclei, it's about two meters long DNA noodle. And these days now, when we do the next generation sequencing, it's about 3.2 billion letters. If you have to put it in a context of a code or a program, or even if you write the book, you know. So how does that 3.2 billion letters sit inside a six micronucleus, a macroscopic thing inside a microscopic space? Isn't that a physical wonder? And that's amazed me, fascinated me, and still does. And I can't 100% explain it, but that's exactly what I have been chasing in my, my career. And I jump out of the bed in the morning because I'm just so excited to find out how does this physical wonder really, really happen in different forms. And not just that, the next one is, we. It, uh, if you just talk about humans, we do start from a single cell, right? And then that single cell divides, you know, mitosis, meiosis, all those phenomena happen. And we turn into these really complicated um, living forms. So have you ever wondered that if it all started from exactly the same code, from one single um, cell, how do we have so many different types of cells in our body? We've got brain cells, kidney cells, tum like, you know, nerve cells skin cells, so many types of cells. How does that all happen? The code is same. How can the same code can do so many different functions? So this is the second biological mystery and it is such an amazing time of um, in the technological advancements we are living that actually we can sequence every single cell and every single gene in our body or in any organism. So it's really, really exciting times with next generation sequencing. But we still have some challenges. And that challenge is most of the techno uh, in terms of the next generation sequencing technologies that we normally can afford or are reasonably priced are short read technologies, which is also called as Illumina sequencing, next generation sequencing. And what that gives us is this on um, like lots and lots of pieces of that DNA noodle, which we're trying to put together as one long contiguous sequence to make sense out of it. But it's a massive job. As I said, it's 3.2 billion letters, right? A machine, an Illumina short read sequencing machine can go read up to 300 base pairs, but nothing beyond that. So just do your maths, 300 base pairs, and you have 3.2 billion base pairs. How are you going to? It's, it requires massive amounts of compute, bioinformatics, um, lots and lots of algorithm development, but still we don't get to see a meaningful way into the genomes, which is supposed to be chromosomes, because chromosomes are those little packets, functional packets, into which DNA organizes itself. It's like you have an encyclopedia, which has different versions, volume one, volume two, volume three, volume four. If you try to put the entire encyclopedia series into one volume, that's not going to be easy to translate, copy, or function. So that's exactly what this DNA does. It packs itself into small chunks or small volumes. It's a whole encyclopedia of life, but organized in chromosomes. So how about if we are able to read these um, DNA information in context, in meaningful ways as chromosomes? And that has been a huge technological challenge um, until now that we have not been able to achieve this. It, it's achieved, but it's super, super expensive. Why? Because when we have short reads, we try to tile them together bioinformatically and we come up with consensus contigues, right? Just to make sure that we got it all right. And every time you read it, it's going to read like this until you hit a repeat. So biological organisms or us or plants even worst, they have lots and lots of repeat content. And that repeat content is what makes it super, super, super hard for um, 
biotechnologies or a next generation sequencing person or bioinformatics person to put it together in a contiguous uh, context of a chromosome because your technologies can't read an entire chromosome in one go. You're going to read it in small snippets and those small snippets with repeats exactly the same. You wouldn't know which one goes which ways. So as a solution for that, a lot of times uh, what we how we solve this scaffolding problem in the world of bioinformatics is we're trying to come up with linking data, okay? Or you're trying to come with long range uh, sequencing, which is very, very expensive. And when you're trying to do these two, two ways, it ends up being a very, very expensive affair. And that has been um, a long standing challenge until we got introduced to HiC. So the DNA Zoo founder, Professor Eris Aiden Lieberman, he is also the inventor of this technology from Bayer College of Medicine. So what that technology, it's, it's a beautiful way to link data. And because of this um, linking capacity, we have been able to bring the cost of an entire genome sequence project, um, like human project, which costed $2.7 billion in more than 10 years for $1,000 now. And that's exactly we run, how we run DNA Zoo Australia or DNA Zoo all over the world. So this is Professor Eris and Lieberman. I got to, um, I started working with him in 2016. And since then we have done quite a lot of work um, in, in this space, assembling genomes across the tree of life. And this also gave birth to DNA Zoo Australia. So how does, let me introduce you guys to high c technology. So high c is high confirmation, high throughput confirmation capture, right? So what this does is to do, to link the data, you cross-link the tissues, okay? Before you extract the DNA. By cross-linking the tissues, you're kind of taking a photo in time. You flash freezing. It's just like taking a photo, okay, of DNA. And as soon as you take that photo, you can cut them with the biological scissors, which are also called as restriction enzymes. You can fill in with some sticky liquid, which can ligate the two ends together. And then you can follow your nose and just pull that out and run a high throughput next generation sequencing. And what that and the data that comes out of it, you run orthogonal mapping, which is very similar to how Facebook identifies when you post a lot of photos with each other. Facebook identifies that maybe you two are connected or you, know, you three are connected, your friends or family or something like that. And that approach is called orthogonal mapping. So just to explain you a little bit more that how we apply that, let's take an example here, okay? So this is Homer Simpson. You must have watched the cartoons of Homer Simpson if you've been, if you've been interested in TV at all in your childhood. So Homer Simpson posts a lot of photos, okay? So we're going we're gonna to collect data from his Facebook page where he's posted a lot of photos, a lot of selfies these days, and photos with his life Marge, his kids Bartley's and Maggie, his neighbors Flanders, and a few other people in the town he hang out with. Okay, so this is a very typical Facebook page. And if I would like to convert this into data, let's try to convert that into a symmetrical matrix. So symmetrical matrix, I mean, it's the X and the Y axis is exactly the same, okay? And we've got the same characters. At the same time, we are start starting to assign a number to each character, okay? That number is how many times that character come in contact with the character on X or Y axis. We humans, we can recognize patterns more quicker than data. So let's overlay that symmetrical square with heat map. And suddenly you start to notice an enrichment square in here. And if you look at the X or Y axis, you'll see that enrichment square is actually depicting the family structure, which is Homer, Homer Marge, and their kids, Bartley's and Maggie. So if I now ask you guys to come back to um, your DNA and those packets, the volumes of the encyclopedia, which were chromosomes. If we do the same exercise when we've taken a photo of the DNA in the tissue, can we may build the same symmetrical matrix by having X and Y chromosomes in your uh, 
sorry, X and Y chromosomes as your um, same same exercise. I'm just putting a genome there, which has got X and Y, uh, which has got a lot of chromosomes. And then I do the same exercise of plotting the data overlaying with a heat map. Okay. And you start to see these little squares or enrichment squares. And these enrichment squares are very similar to what you saw in uh, Homer Simpson's little symmetrical matrix. And these are your little chromosomes. Problem solved, isn't it? This was one of the longest standing challenge of genomics field to assemble chromosomes at a chromosome length assembly. The day we got to start to do this, this has made life super, super, super easy. So I'm just gonna give you a little video here that how does this software package works once you generate the high throughput sequencing data. Let's take a look. So this is a genome, which, uh, which I spent seven years of my career trying to put together a chromosome length assembly, probably spent half a million dollars to do. It's a half a gig genome, uh, which nowadays we can do less than $500. And these are really nice eight chromosomes. It only took 10 minutes using this software developed by Dr. Dol Olga Dachenko in Baylor College of Medicine lab. Once we were able to take a photograph of that DNA, uh, which was troubling me for seven years. And that was the beginning of this all this exciting work, which I have been able to achieve in the last few years of my life. And um, it's not just for very simple, simple assemblies, which have got eight chromosomes in here, but you can actually do very, very complicated assemblies, which have got thousands and thousands of uh, short pieces into really neat three chromosomes. And this is the genome of the Aedes aegypti yellow mosquito virus, which caused Zika epidemic in the last, um, in 20, 2017. So pretty deadly. And this was one of the biggest challenges which made it to the, um, to the front page of the New York Times as well. So all this, what I've talked to you guys, it's actually a free software for anybody to use on GitHub. You can follow this link and you can go and try yourself. It's one click analysis, end to end, um, high C data analysis using Juicer. The software is called Juicer. So now when we were able to sort of see the power of using this linking data, how can we use it? What is the big challenge which our humanity is facing? And a lot of organizations, including Broad Institute, New York uh, University, Australia, and many other countries, Bella College of Medicine, we all got together and we trying to sort of put it to some good purpose. And that was the time uh, in 2018 when we launched the DNA Zoo and uh, with a roadmap uh, for a big problem which our mankind or humankind is facing at this moment on the planet. I don't know how many of you know, but we lose overall one spe three species every single hour. Something which is going extinct and never coming back to us. Every day, up to 150 species are lost, and in a year, from 18,000 to 55,000 species are gone. And that is leaving our ecosystems completely broken with about 1 million species sitting at the brink of extinction at this moment. I'm not sure how many of you um, can accept 
that our coming generations will only be able to see the elephant in a picture book, but not a real elephant. And same goes for the tigers and same goes for the lions. So I'm a strong believer that if biodiversity fails, then all these advancements in the technological world um, are coming to an end because this is not gonna be a viable planet uh, for just humans to live on. We are part of the ecosystem and the ecosystem is very, very intricately connected. And this whole web of life can very easily uh, get into a chaos of nothing. So how research can help? Look, most of the research, you're looking for a cure for cancer, but you're looking in a lab rat or, or a few mice species, which are model species, because you could never afford genomic uh, or high resolution resources. So we thought this is a great way. Now we can do this. So why not build that and then try and make life better for these species. But at the same time, we will also be able to identify many new ways to tackle the problems which we are facing like SARS-CoV-2 at this moment. So we started building the reference genomes and reference genomes are not just required for conservation purposes, but they are actually required to assess the diversity, relatedness, identification of a lot of species which we don't even know these days. Two things may look different, but they may be very same at the genetic level and vice versa. It is also required for population management, genome-wide association studies, for economic traits in the crops, and many, many, many other, um, other uses. I'm sure if you're exploring the field of genomics, you would know that. At the same time, yes, we, we are at that technological advanced stage that we can really bring back the already gone extinct species. But one, one single individual is going to cost something like $15 million. I'm not sure um, what would be your thoughts in terms of spending that $15 to bring one single individual. That's not going to probably help our planet, but rather save the ones which are leaving us at a very fast rate. So this is DNA Zoo. Um, please go and visit the website www.dnazoo.org where you will see more than 250 chromosome length genome assemblies, which we have been building in the last two and a half years. It's across a tree of life. It's not just animals, it's plants, it's crops, it's all sorts of things, parasites, viruses, you will see everything there. I have been mostly focusing on the iconic Australian species, and we have done more than 40 species, which you will also get to see in there. So the purpose we have been working is to be able to understand this code of life, the blueprint of life, not just in us, but also in many other forms of life so that we can understand where it all started and where it is all headed. And with a lot and lot data coming on board, with AI, with machine learning, with genome editing, synthetic biology, we're able to do so much more to not just help those species, to help mankind, to help feed 9 billion people on the planet, which is going to be the case in 2050, to help with all the different challenges, the health problems we are facing. And I call that responsible bioprospecting to better understand, conserve, and utilize the biodiversity. All I have shared with you is present on DNA Zoo website. So please go and subscribe the DNA Zoo because we publish one genome or two genomes sometimes every week. You can follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Everything I shared with you today is available in the Genome Assembly Cookbook. Again, available for you guys to download freely and read and about the methods, the code, and how the whole thing works. With that, I would like to say thank you so much for inviting the talk and um, giving us this opportunity to connect. And I would like to thank all the sponsors, all the partners who, and the funding bodies who've made this possible. And I would love to take some questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. It was really an interesting session. And uh, Actually, honestly, uh, your name was suggested by one of our colleagues at uh, Harvard. Uh, his Dr. Vinay, he's a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. So he mm -hmm. suggested when I told him about the conference, he suggested to approach you. And thank you for kindly accepting the invitation and uh, delivering the talk today. Uh, so Pleasure. as I told you, I 
went through the newsletter that you have i think it was an interview that you gave uh, to stem women in stem or something like that and you declared yourself as a dna nerd and i can clearly see that in your lecture <laughs> thank you yes <laughs> uh, i am just fascinated like this um there is so much we're not even scratching the surface i think and mother nature has all the solutions i think we just need to look a little bit closer and i think dna can tell us a lot um, yeah I, I i don't know i mean how much you guys will agree with me but i very strongly believe that yeah, we definitely agree with you mom and we want more and more people to work on this amazing iconic molecule of biology which is dna and try to understand more about life by understanding dna Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, I request the participants to ask the questions. Mom is available for five more minutes. Maybe uh, yeah. you can drop your questions in the chat box. And Mom, in the meantime, uh, I've also uh, come to know that. Uh, uh, could you please throw some light on your personal uh, career graph as well? Because I'll I'll explain you the context. We are Telangana Social Welfare Residential Institutions and in Government of Telangana, one of the South Indian states, yes. and uh, we have thirty uh, residential degree colleges established in two thousand sixteen, catering to the marginalized women, educational needs of marginalized women, and with a single motto, we established to postpone early marriages because most of these women come from marginalized sections. uh they are forced uh to undergo like uh, to uh, for early marriages so to postpone that the government has uh, established degree colleges in a residential pattern and we have more than uh, 17000 women with us who are currently enlo- enrolled in the undergraduate program and all our workforce is completely women mm-hmm. we have all women faculty so mm-hmm. i think uh, one message for all the women out there who are working really hard to make their uh, careers and who are dreaming of a career in science from you would be nice yeah sure i mean i i can tell you guys that i come from a very uh, simple family my dad was an army in india indian army so two kids mom was a complete housewife so it's not like you know we were not very well off like whatever dad earned was just enough to probably educate one child um in a university i was very lucky um i when i clear when i completed my year 12 i got admission into a dental college i'll be very honest with you guys and also um uh, i topped in the agricultural university of uh, state agricultural university i always wanted to be a doctor like in most most of the most of the kids in india you know when you're preparing for pre medical examination you you either want to be an mbbs doctor or a bds doctor and that's exactly what i wanted to be but when we looked at the fees it was a little too much for my dad to afford and i was just like well, that's okay uh, and i'm i'm going to have a scholarship in agricultural university and the moment i walked into the university i fell in love with the campus it was beautiful fields and stuff so i have never regretted coming into agriculture but life is absolutely amazing and i must say that if there is one thing which can empower you is education and i have been able to fulfill more than i ever dreamt of for my life just by empowering myself with education and i'm sorry to say but we live in a country or in a our culture is like this that the parents are how well they are or they are in a marginalized space their aim is daughters to get married in a better like in a in a good family and that's that's the best they want to achieve for their daughters but it's never we are never asked that what we really want from our life right and that's where i would say that having a passion is absolutely absolutely important not just for boys but also for girls and i had a similar problem dad was like okay now you are graduate so get married and like no <laughs> i want to do masters started doing masters the day i completed my masters um 
you know the they started looking for rishta and all that sort of stuff and i was like no i want to do a phd and that was uh that was kind of the time when family was like no 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 you 25 no it's you can't study anymore and i'm so grateful to the australian government because australian government has this program of giving international postgraduate research scholarships and i applied it only it it was only 50 dollars and it's pretty much the same uh, enrollment or application fees this moment as well and if you win a scholarship it's very very competitive when i apply there was about 300 um, students all over the world apply people from us germany everywhere apply but if you have a good track record and you've achieved really well in your masters and your undergrad honors degree you can win yourself a scholarship and they even give you um living expenses not just the scholarship, which covers your fees for entire PhD degree, but it also gives you living expenses, which is more than enough for you to survive rent, food, everything. And all I did was study for those four years. And they were the best years of my life because I could just soak in, soak in, soak in and do whatever I wanted to do in my life. So knowledge is very empowering. Never, ever give up on yourself because if you give up on yourself, that's it. Nobody ever is going to believe in you. So before you make others believe in you, believe in yourself. And there will definitely be a way. If I can support any of you in any uh, capacity, I will be very happy. Lots of uh, people write for scholarships. So if you want any further information, I'll be very happy to connect and mentor. Just give drop me a line in my, in my email address. But it all comes down to building a good track record, getting experience, even if it is helping others voluntarily in the research work of your seniors and stuff, build yourself a track record, learn. Okay. Um, Thank you so much. Do we have a question here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, there is a um, question from Srinivas Ketawat. Awesome. So it's asking, I have a question that while generating the contact matrix of high C data, there is a relation between number of reads and contact metro solution. So if we go higher resolution, people suggest that false positive interactions will originate. For eukaryotic species, how many aligned reads does it require for 5KB contact matrix? And what is the sequence step you recommend? Okay, so for a thousand dollar genome approach or to go up to 200, 200 KB resolution, you require about 30X short read coverage and 10X high C coverage. So that's not a lot, and that's what exactly cost you about something around under under a thousand dollars of sequencing. But if you want to go to five KB resolution, then you need to go really really deep, and you need to probably go up to hundred hundred X resolution. And I highly recommend you read the two thousand and nine paper by Aiden. Um, it's the, who's the first author? Rao Rao et al. Rao et al. Two thousand and nine paper in Cell because that's where they have gone very, very, uh, very, very high resolution, like 5KB window. But just to be to be honest with you guys, you really don't need to go to that resolution unless you're trying to resolve the fundamentals of genome architecture, like flu formations and all that sort of stuff, and understand the enhancers or regulation mechanisms of DNA. If you just want to build a genomic resource for a species where you can have, um, you can have, high confidence genome models, 200 KB window is when your, um, you know, your enhancers and your promoters can work both ways. And that's more than enough. And that only costs you a thousand dollar sequencing cost. Have I answers, answered your questions, Srinivas? You can unmute yourself and ask it. Or I'm happy to discuss. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, if there are no further questions, then maybe we will um, uh, we can request ma'am to leave. Or uh, thank you so much for your time, ma'am. Thank you, uh, thank you, really Dr. Pamini. I that, really appreciate. Uh, yes, we really appreciate that you take out the time to be here with us. Even though uh, there's a time difference, you've been here, and this definitely was a very exciting session. And the way he delivered the session was uh, definitely mind blowing and also inspiration for a lot of us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, and good luck for the rest of the conference. Hope you guys go 
very inspired at the end, end of the conference from DNA and pursue that. I'll be, I'll be waiting to hear from some of you if you would like to pursue in Australia. Thank you, ma'am. Bye. Thank All you. Right. So this concludes uh, our lecture segment of the conference for today. And as mentioned earlier in the inaugural, we will conclude today's uh, workshop or today's conference with a quiz. And I hope that all of you have paid attention throughout the lecture because we will have questions that are derived from those lectures. Uh, may I now request Dr. Parmi to uh, conduct the quiz. Mute. Uh, thank you, Shiva. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So the participant number is going down. So I would say whoever are leaving the meeting, they're going to miss the cash prizes or the exciting prizes that they're going with from the quiz competition. I can see a few of the participants since morning. They've been listening very attentively and they've even been taking notes. I appreciate your commitment uh, to learn more from the conference. The whole objective is that to uh, give you an update on the recent trends uh, in DNA research and so that you carry all that information again back to the classrooms for your students. So let's get to the quiz and before we start the quiz i want all the participants uh, to be there in the meeting we'll be having two quizzes part one and part two based on today's lectures quiz part one will have five questions and part two will have five more questions and we'll have one winner from each part and the quiz is open for students primarily but the faculty can also try it because it's always fun to participate in a quiz competition so, but remember that uh, this quiz competition has been organized to encourage the students to listen more attentively to the lectures and so that they, to make sure that they remember something or take back something from the conference or the lectures. So the cash prizes or the winner prizes are only for the students, but the faculty are free to participate in the quiz. So before we start again, let me tell you how this works. We're going to use the Mentimeter for conducting the quiz today. Uh, I'm not sure if you have already, you already know about the platform. Mentimeter is an online quiz platform. So what you have to do is that all you have to do is go to www.menti.com. There is a website called www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, menti.com. So you can go there and for the quiz, you'll be getting a quiz ID you'll be getting a code to start the quiz. So what we'll do is you go to the website, enter the code, then you'll be taken to that quiz. Then you'll be asked to give your name. So please give your name. With the name, if you can give your designation, it would be really nice because if we have students in the uh, meeting or I also understand uh, that uh, few students are joining through teacher's devices, teachers are at the school and they're helping students attend the conference. So if, if you have any students who are participating from a teacher's device, please give the student's name there so that we can uh, uh, know who is participating, okay? So there you enter the code and then give your name, then you'll be taken to the quiz. So we'll keep this meeting running. And if you have any doubts in uh, accessing the quiz, uh, you can please drop a message in the chat box. What? Just a minute. Okay, I'll see. So I will just share screen then. No, I have to share. I'll start screen sharing. So this is quiz one. Can you all see my screen? Please give a thumbs up or you can just show like this if your video is on. Yes. So this is the code. If you can see the code. Can you see? Because I can see my controls. Okay. So please enter the code or you can also use the QR code if you have another device. If you have a mobile. So 
So please enter your name and designation. What is this? Okay. Just a moment. Yep, presenting right. Did they answer? Okay, what's happening? Okay. It's not coming. Okay, it's not coming. It's taking the old one. Just engage them because we have already taken the quiz all right i hope uh, you've been able to find the website um, we will share the new link with you in just a moment uh, could you please be patient with us we're really sorry for the inconvenience Okay, so this is a new code. Um, it's four five two zero seven six one. If you're already on the website, uh, please type in this code and it will redirect you to the quiz. You could also use the QR if you want to scan. Eleven, twelve, the join. I think the earlier one because. Okay, we have 28 participants who joined. Let us wait some more time. Those who have joined, please wait. We are waiting for others to join as well. We have 33 participants ready for the quiz now. Okay, we have 93 participants, but only 35 registered for the quiz.
40 people have joined the quiz. So I'm assuming that you have figured it out how to access the Menti quiz. 42, good. So we are going to close the quiz once it reaches the number 50. So we have reached 45, 46. I request the others to keep waiting. Uh, we will start the quiz once we reach 50 registrations. Okay, 47, I'm going to close it, uh, start the quiz in one minute. 48. Forty-nine. What? Okay, 50, I'm going to start the quiz now. Uh, the others can try there like in the part two. Uh, okay, how do we start? Here comes the first question. Okay, we have all the players. Oh, interesting. So here we start. Three, two, one, go. So the faster you give your answer, more points you're going to get. SSR stands for. This was explained in Rakesh Mishra sir's lecture in the morning keynote address. SSR stands for what? And I, again, I'm repeating, the one who answers correctly fast gets more points. So the time also matters. You have to be quick. It's like a KVC here. The fastest finger will come first. Two, one. Time's up. Nice. 30 of them got it right. Interest. That means you were attentive. Okay. A Rajavira Shankar. Let's see who got it first. Oh, it's very close. It's very close. 980 points for A, Rajavira Shankar, and you were the fastest. Congratulations, Rajavir. Let's see how you'll do in the second question. Yeah, the second question is here. Genomics is the study of genomes. We have, we have had two sessions on genomics. So what actually is a genome? We had Dr. Venu and Dr. Gautam speak about genomics. So I want to know how many of you have actually understood what is a genome. So let's see the answers. How many got it right? It's a pretty simple question. Good. 33 of you got it right. 
genome is the total DNA present in the organism. Now let's move to the leaderboard again. It's stuck. So what happened? It's stuck. Okay. Now let's see who is in the lead. It's Vasu. Okay. So you can see that the leaderboard keeps changing with each question. So you have, if you have to stay on lead, you have to keep up your performance. Then the third question. Uh, we have been talking about personalized medicine since morning in both uh, Rakesh Mishra's session and also Dr. Gautam's session. So what is it actually based on? What component of the genome does it actually look into personalized medicine? Okay, three, two, one. Let's see how many of you got this right. Nice. So you were really attentive in the classes and sessions. Now it's time to see the leaderboard again. Why is it not moving? Shailaja. Okay, Shailaja is the leader as of now. Let's see who comes top in the next question. Question four. So this was talked in Dr. Venu's lecture. He talked for almost a couple of slides on differences that you find in identical twins. Come on, as I told you, answering right is not enough. You have to be fast. Nice. Okay, teachers, you're doing an amazing job. Yeah, even the students. Because... Okay. Please write down full tops. Okay. okay. It's V Chaitanya now. V Chaitanya is in the lead. Let's see if V Chaitanya comes out to be the winner from this quiz competition. We have one more question to see. So the last question for this quiz round. What is a nucleosome? What is a nucleosome? Again, this was mentioned in Dr. Veno's session. Are we recording?
come on the, your last chance to win exciting prizes last question for this quiz Mm -hmm. Let's see who is the winner for this. Okay, so the winner for the day one quiz, part one is... Okay, Sup, who is Sup? Could you please raise your hand in the Zoom meeting? We would like to see you. Obviously, we can't give you a certificate on the name of Sup. <laughs> okay, it's Supriya Malipedi. Congratulations, Supriya. You have won the quiz round one of day one. Supriya, you are from? I'm from Marangal, ma'am, Kashbuga. MSc Biotechnology, Kapti University, ma'am. Congratulations, Supriya. You were really attentive. Okay. So, I'm going to stop sharing now. Get ready for another quiz. As I told you, we have two quizzes for day one. So, you can try your luck in the next round of quiz. For all those who couldn't make it today uh, in this round. All right. As uh, Pavli ma'am said for the second quiz, uh, there are a couple of announcements. One is we'll be using the same link for tomorrow's uh, conference as well. And as you know, the link is already available on the website. And we will also uh, post that in the WhatsApp group. So please join. And tomorrow's session begins at 10 a.m. Um, may, and you can find the program sheet and uh, all the activities listed down there. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to us either on the email or uh, you can write to us on the WhatsApp group as well. And the second thing is we've developed a few feedback forms and uh, for specific lectures. And I will be sharing those feedback forms with you now um, in the chat box. If you could take a um, couple of minutes while uh, Dr. Parmi sets up her quiz. Uh, if you could answer those, it will help us to assess um, how the sessions were, uh, how useful these sessions were to you. And it will also help us um, improve and uh, work on whatever suggestions that you give us. Thank you so much. And uh, the links will be available to you in a minute. And uh, please note that there are four different links for each session. And you will have to fill up each of them. I know it is a little tiresome, but I would really request you to kind of go through all of them and uh, please give your valuable feedback. Thank and you. please be honest with your feedback. It's okay. We don't mind negative feedback. In fact, we would love because only yeah. then we can improve. We would, we would like to know what went well and we would love to know what did go well for you. Do let us know if you have any trouble accessing the links. The same links also will be posted in the WhatsApp group uh, if you are unable to um, access them here. And for those of you who haven't joined the WhatsApp group, I will also be sharing the link for the WhatsApp group in the chat. So please feel free to join our WhatsApp group. So last time there was very little competition. Now I want all the 80, 80 participants to join the quiz session just for fun. If I had the chance, I would definitely play and try my luck. So I want everyone to register for the quiz for the round two. And let's see how many of you can win. Oh, oh, sorry. It is only one winner, but let's see how close we can get to that spot. Uh, 
Okay, uh, can you see the quiz link for the round one? Here is a code. I'm going to start presenting. Here is the code. You can start joining. It's the same process. Just go to menti.com, enter the code, and then give your name. In the meanwhile, I request the last round winner to drop her details in the chat box so that our team can make a note and use it for certificate. And please drop your contact number as well so that we can contact you for any additional information. The winner for round one, please drop your contact number directly to Shiba Roy. not in the public chat box. I think we have seven. Twenty seven joints so far. Come on. It's not fun without the competition. I want everybody to be sportive and participate actively in the quiz. Okay. We have thirty who have logged in. Okay, still only 34. We understand you're all tired. It's been a really long day, but I hope you have enjoyed the sessions too. So it's just five more minutes. We can wind up day one. Okay, if there are no more participants interested to for the quiz round, I'll start. Huh? Okay, I'm going to start the quiz now. Okay, all the best players.
all the bananas, crocodiles, and dinosaurs out there. Yes, please identify the scientists A and B in the given picture. We all know who are they, but do you exactly know who each of them is? Who is who? Is it Watson and Crick or Crick and Watson or Wilkins and Crick? It's a very famous picture. And our conference is incomplete without talking about them and their work. So we just wanted to know if you actually know who is Watson and who is Crick. Let's see how many of you get it right. Three, two, one. Oh, see? Not just names. You have to remember the faces as well sometimes. The one who was sitting was Watson and the one who is standing is Ms. Uh, Dr. Crick. So next time you would remember who is Watson and who is Crick. Going to the next. Let's see who are those 10. Okay. Our Mamta was the fastest. Let's see if she can save her spot. Question two. And this is a comic. I'm sure you, most of you know about Kelvin. Read the comic. It says the mother is shouting at the child, the boy who is Kelvin. And he's a very naughty guy, a naughty boy. He has created a lot of mess on the table. Then the mother is shouting at the father. It's your fault we didn't have a sweet little girl. Your stupid chromosome, not mine. That's what she's saying. She's blaming the father for Kelvin's mischief. So we want you to figure out what is the science concept which is presented in the cartoon. What does it mean when the mother is blaming the father? Is she actually right or she's just, does she have a scientific basis for her blame? Okay, 16 of you got it right. It's about the XY method of sex determination. So Deshati Vaishnavi is in the lead now. So that slide was purposefully uh, included in the quiz so that we also wanted to create an awareness in the society. Usually the women are blamed when they have more uh, girl child and uh, we also see instances where the women are left or the guys remarry just because they're not having sons. I want all the teachers to educate the children that uh, having a girl child or, or a boy child depends on the chromosome that the father uh, transmits to the mother uh, during fertilization. X and Y, if the father gives the X sperm, you'll have a baby girl. If the father gives the Y chromosome or the Y sperm, you get a baby boy. So the mother has no role in deciding or determining the sex of the baby. So we want you to create awareness on this uh, concept in your classrooms as well, because we see most of this uh, issue uh, uh, in the in our families. So yeah, so Deshati Vaishnavi, are you, I hope you're ready for the next question. Uh, so DNA is the only genetic material for all the living organisms. Is it true or false? We are talking so much about DNA. It's only DNA for these two days now. <laughs> so why is it 
that it has become an icon molecule is it because it's the only genetic material for all the living organisms is it true or false the same question 150 years ago frederick mischer asked the same question what is the genetic material now we are asking you the same questions 150 years later is dna the only genetic material yes dna is not the only genetic material the best example that I, that i can give you is the coronavirus you know that a living and coronaviruses or viruses have rna as their genetic material so moving on to the next question oh time to see the leaderboard it's again deshati vaishnavi good going vaishnavi let's see if you can save your spot in the next question the fourth question here you go ngs stands for it has been talked about in morning session session 1 it has so many applications all the omics data that we are seeing today it's possible because of ngs so what exactly is ngs yes ngs stands for next generation sequencing let's see who is on the top of the list oh oh it's deepthi deshiti you are you have been moved to number 2 slot so i think you still have a chance to reclaim <laughs> last question for the day last chance what's happening this was talked in one of the sessions in the morning in dr mishra's session to be specific he mentioned that they have done carried out this experiment to understand how non coding dna works using a model organism i want to know what was the model organism that they used nice yes it was a fruit fly and for all the students who joined please understand that fruit fly has contributed so much it's a invaluable model organism in the field of research it's also called as drosophila okay time to see who is the winner Deepthi with four thousand two hundred and thirty-seven points, she is the winner. Deepthi, could you please raise your hand? Congratulations, Deepthi. Yeah. Okay. Deepthi. Okay. Could you please unmute her? Yeah. Who is Deepthi? Hi. Uh, yeah. Okay. Hello. Uh, could you please uh, tell us where you're from and 
I am Deepam from Kannur. Actually, I am an MBBS graduate. Oh, okay. So, how did you know about the conference, ma'am? Yeah, I got to know through some uh, friends, colleagues. I just contacted Jagdish sir and oh. and I'm part of it. Okay, okay. Congratulations, anyways. Uh, so we'll again and uh, please join the closing ceremony tomorrow. Please attend all the uh-huh. sessions tomorrow. We also have interesting lecture schedule for day two. So in the closing ceremony, uh, both the names of the winners for today's quiz will be announced, and prizes would be distributed now. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Deepthi Thank you so much, all of you, for letting me join this conference. <laughs> Thank you. So. Over to you, Shiva. Ah, uh, Deepthi, could you please share before we close the session? Please share. Ah, uh, direct message Shiva Roy in the okay. chat. Your details, your name, what are you doing, and your phone number, contact number, so that we can reach you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Over to you, Shiva. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was a very lively quiz, and uh, I am glad that all the participants got a chance to test out. Uh, everything that they have heard throughout the day uh, we will call it a uh, close for this day and hoping that we will see you tomorrow morning at 10 am ist as mentioned already the link will be available on the website for you to join and i've also shared the links for feedback please use the link uh, so that we can learn a little more about how we can improve and uh, also use the link for the whatsapp group um, to join and in order for us to be able to communicate quickly and uh, tomorrow we will also be doing um, the dna isolation um, workshop we'll have uh, one of the presenters uh, presenters here and hopefully by then you would have already received your kits and please don't worry they're all in transit already even if you're not able to get the kit by tomorrow the lecture will be recorded and it is also available live on youtube so whenever it is that you get your kit you can uh, do the experiment at home and uh, see how you can isolate dna all right on that note uh, thank you all for joining thank you dr jagdish and all right no all right we will see you all tomorrow i hope you have a very good evening oh mummy and come back energized uh, and prepared for a one day full of lectures to quizzes today thank you so much thank you so much for joining everyone you were really patient so have a good, very good evening and we'll see you all tomorrow please come back recharged with full energy we are going to isolate dna today we talked about dna tomorrow we are going to do the dna <laughs>